public hearing for the 2019 budget uh, to order. Uh, following the public hearing, we will discuss and vote on the FY19 budget and uh, discuss and vote on the uh, reconstruction budget. So now the public hearing is open. Uh, if you have anything to, to say, if you can go up to the, to the podium and just state your name and then have at it. Yes, Mr. Reed. I just want to report what is happening on the street tonight. I have a couple of others that are going to be here tonight. Somebody saying you're not on the mic. Somebody saying you might not be on the mic. Um, yeah, okay. Can you all hear me? Yeah, okay. So, um, my name is Autumn Hendrickson, and I'm currently a sophomore at RMHS. And as a member of the student body, I think I can speak for my peers when I say that this whole situation is rather scary. I've overheard many impassioned conversations about the current budget situation between my peers, and it's rather inspiring. And I'd like to echo their sentiments. Just from listening to my peers at school every day, the idea I get is that they are very upset with the idea of cutting the foreign languages from the middle schools in particular. I'm in agreement with them. As a freshman last year, I had a very interesting and enlightening experience thanks to my prior education in Spanish. I got the chance to converse with and, assi and assist a new student who knew very limited English. I met her in my history class about halfway through the year. It was clear to me that she did not really speak English, and in an effort to make her feel welcome, I mustered up the courage to speak to her in Spanish. It was amazing what that one interaction resulted in for both of us. She seemed much more relaxed when I began speaking to her. I had relieved some of her stress, and I was very happy with that. For me, I learned to take more risks in conversation, and I became more confident in my own abilities. There were still many struggles. Sometimes I'd say something to her and receive a blank stare, and then we'd both just crack up laughing. There were other times when we really did have to resort to Google Translate because I could not find a workaround that she understood, but that relationship was one of the most enriching relationships I've ever had with someone, and I would not have been able to ever have that without seventh and eighth grade Spanish classes. The world we live in today is an increasingly global place. I can pick up my cell phone and text someone in Australia, in Mexico, in England, Norway, Turkey, all of these new amazing places. Taking away the ability to learn a language at a younger age will become the Achilles heel of Reading's future if we don't tread carefully. We need worldly people. End of story. This is not something that should need to be negotiated. Not learning a language other than our mother tongue will come back to bite us later down the road. And that's not something I want, it's not something our teachers want, and it's not something you should want. I love Reading. I love going to school here. I've been blessed with so many amazing teachers that I can't even count them on one hand, perhaps not even on two hands. When I first came here in fifth grade, many of my teachers in Florida had dismissed me, not really seeming to care very much. In my one year at Barrows Elementary School, I made a connection with a teacher who I still go back to visit two or three times a year. When I moved on to Parker, I was absolutely terrified, but I was pleasantly surprised by a community that lifted me up instead of throwing me aside like so many others had. On my worst days, there was always someone there for me, whether it was a peer or a teacher. In seventh grade, I made a connection with my science teacher, who I still try to go visit at least once a year. But these people that you want to cut, they're wonderful human beings. They genuinely care for each and every one of their students. And to think that they could be gone in a year saddens not just me, but almost all of my peers. We care about this community just as much as everyone else. Just because we're students doesn't make our voice any less powerful or any less meaningful. We are your future. We won't let you down. That's our promise. But please don't let us down. Don't cut our foreign languages. Don't cut our double block of VLA. Don't cut our teachers. Our futures are hanging in the balance here, and we're sort of hanging by a thread. Please don't cut that thread. Thank you.
evening. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Julie Wall, and I live on Colburn Road with my husband and our two children. Our family loves the community of Reading, and we could not be happier with or more thankful for the experience our daughter has had thus far as a student in the Reading Public Schools. As a parent and former 7th and 8th grade Spanish teacher at two local middle schools, I am here tonight to express my concerns for the proposed elimination of foreign language study at Parker and Coolidge Middle Schools. I'd like to address a question raised at Thursday's school committee meeting on whether the 12 towns considered budget peers of Reading offer foreign language programs at the middle school level. Upon researching these budget peer towns, I have learned that each community provides foreign language study for its middle school age students. Spanish and French are offered at every middle school. In addition, six of these school districts also offer Chinese, Latin, Italian, and or German at their middle schools. I was also curious about school districts more local to Reading, and I've learned that Reading's six neighboring communities, North Reading, Woburn, Wakefield, Linfield, Wilmington, and Stoneham, all provide middle school foreign language programs. Each district offers a Spanish program, and five of the six also teach French and or Italian. While researching these 18 communities, I encountered validating remarks on the rationale for teaching foreign language at the middle school level. For example, the Chelmsford Public School websites, website explains, quote, the earlier the start, the easier the mastery. And the earlier the start, the higher the level of proficiency achieved. Students with a longer exposure to a foreign language generally acquire more and better skills than those with a shorter exposure, end quote. On a more personal note, I'd like to share that in my experience as a classroom teacher, middle school age students embrace learning a new language with such enthusiasm that it disheartens me to think that our current 6th and 7th grade students may lose out on this opportunity. I respectfully ask that the community of Reading consider how the elimination of middle school foreign language will reflect on our priorities as a town. As we attempt to prepare this generation of students for communication and citizenship in an increasingly global society, we must not deprive them of this learning opportunity. Instead, we need to view and value the study of world languages as a fundamental and non-negotiable component of any quality 21st century education. Thank you. Hola, buenas tardes. Yo soy Kevin Yasuhashi y hace dos años que yo aprendo el español. Hello and good evening. My name is Kevin Yasuhashi and I've been learning Spanish for two years. I truly love to learn this language and I plan to learn it all throughout high school, taking AP Spanish in my senior year. I really look forward to, to becoming fluent in a second language and I'm sure many of my peers would agree. I started learning Spanish in seventh grade and in middle school I had a great foundation for, to prepare me for the Spanish that I am learning this year. I am absolutely sure that without this foundation I would not be completely lost with the Spanish that I am learning this year and I am also sure that I would not know enough Spanish to be able to take the AP level when I am a senior. I'm sure that many other students who are going to be coming into middle school will want to take a foreign language, whether it be French or Spanish, and keep learning it all throughout high school and maybe even into college. I urge you not to cut these languages from middle school so that these arising students can pursue what may become one of their favorite subjects as become mine and maybe even go into a profession that involves a foreign language. Thank you. <clears throat> Hola, me llamo Lori Atsuhashi y empecé a aprender el español el septiembre. Hi, my name is Lori Atsuhashi and I started learning Spanish in September. Even though I've only been studying a new language for a few months, Spanish is my favorite class and I look forward to it every day. 
My Spanish teacher always makes each day fun and entertaining. Taking Spanish is not just beneficial to me now, but I can benefit from it in the future. Knowing a second language is a key that can open me to different cultures, people, and experiences. I want to continue increasing my Spanish vocabulary in eighth grade, and someday I would like to take AP Spanish in high school. But if foreign language is not available to middle schoolers next year, then I will have to restart my Spanish studies in ninth grade. By taking a whole year off from Spanish, I will not be advanced enough to ever participate in an AP Spanish class. This will be a problem for all seventh graders who want to become exceptional at a foreign language as well. This does not just affect students learning a language this year, but it also affects students who, like sixth graders who are eager to start a new language. Sixth graders will have to wait until ninth grade to even start a language, and that is not an ideal point to start learning a different language. So on behalf of the sixth graders who desperately want to take foreign language next year, and on behalf of the seventh graders who want to go on with their studies and journey, far, and journey farther into learning a new language, I ask that foreign language is not cut from middle school. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, um, this one? Anne Marie Corey, um, 16 Mount Vernon Street. I also am a teacher here at the high school, um, special ed, ninth and 10th grade, and I have a daughter here who's junior at high school. Um, I've been really struggling with what to say. I realize I have kind of a unique position being a parent and a resident and an educator here in Reading. And um, what I can tell you is that this has been a very emotional time. Um, the thought of our schools continuing to struggle um, and taking even further hits is very painful. Um, from the high school perspective, I'd like to speak a little bit about losing foreign language at the middle school. Um, just the sheer logistics of trying to educate the entire ninth grade in, in year one of Spanish or French is daunting. Uh, our, my colleagues have been discussing how are we going to accommodate these kids. We want to do our best for these kids. Um, we don't teach that many sections of Spanish one or French one currently. Um, it's it would be a major rearrangement of the high school culture, of our educational program. Um, you're talking about trying to fit four years of language in where many kids typically only need three years to do so. Um, their senior year will become much more crowded. Electives will become much less possible for them. These are just some of the logistical pieces, kind of the domino effect. Um, I think many people have spoken very eloquently about the effect on the middle schoolers this year and I think that's where a lot of the emotion comes from for me is for, for these kids who they should have this opportunity. Um, in all of my roles what pains me is that we continue to take from the education of our kids in school. We don't look outside of school hours. Um, there are many areas in this town that are valued and I have um, great respect for athletics and music and drama and all those wonderful things that we can provide for our children through the public schools. But I think our number one task is for when our children are here for the hours of school that we're supposed to do our best to educate them in academics here. And then we can talk about extracurriculars. And I understand, believe me, I have many students for whom Extracurriculars are the motivator. So I'm not saying they need to go away, but I don't, I can't fathom how we're talking about cutting foreign language and we're not talking about cutting freshman athletics or JV. This is something that was on the table when I was in high school. We might have lost our JV programming because the, the district simply couldn't afford it and continue to provide academic programming at the same level. I don't understand why it's not even on the table. And so, respectfully, I would like to ask that. Um, why are we not discussing that further? Why do we assume that those things would just stay as they are, those are status quo, and we're going to look at academics for the place to cut? Thank you.
You want else? Sleeper. We're back at Lieberman, 50 Pratt Street. Um, I just wanted to follow on um, that excellent remarks from a moment ago and just ask uh, all of you to ask yourselves, is this the best you can do for our students? Because I believe we can do better and we should. This is not acceptable. And ignoring the issue of override, with or without an override, we need to, this is a core mission of ours. Uh, I believe our mission statement reads that we are to instill a instilling a love of learning, and here you're taking away something that instills a love of learning. And I respectfully ask, just as the person before me did, that you look everywhere else but not at teaching positions. And we cannot be going through this year after year threatening the core mission of our schools and the people who implement that core mission. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. <coughs> Hi, good evening everyone. Um, my name is Donna Schindelman. I'm at 16 Governors Drive and I quite honestly was not expecting to come up, but um, I will disclose to you all that I am a mental health professional and my specialty is people between the ages of 18 and 25. And I say this to you because I treat a lot of people with anxiety disorders, mood disorders, etc. And one thing through my 20 years of doing this work, I can tell you is that the foundation that kids get in their education and the support and not really hearing the rumors and things like that that are going on. My one child is a kill him. She heard from a teacher, we can't laminate things anymore. We can't this, we can't that. I have another student that's at Parker and even though he's moving on to the high school, he's actually upset about the foreign language <coughs> being dismissed. What I would ask is that we try and look at this for the values that Reading has posted on and on. I moved here 19 years ago from New York. If I get more upset, you'll hear that accent come out. Um, don't worry, I'm a Pats fan. <laughs> but but I, I think that what I'm trying to say is that um, you know, anytime I said we're looking in Reading, we bought a house in Reading, people would just go, oh, you're so lucky. The education system is great. They didn't talk about 93, 95. They didn't talk about the housing. They talked about the education year after year after year. So I'm just asking that we take a moment to think about what foundation we're giving the kids in middle school and are we taking away other things from them that could benefit them in the future? And I don't know what the answers are. Um, I know this has been a, a painful and difficult process for everybody, but I will tell you that the patients that walk in my office, they didn't have as a well-rounded support and education that I feel proud up until this point to have my children have. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maxwell Carcioni and I'm a seventh grader at the Coolidge Middle School. I'm coming before the school committee because I think that the budget is detrimental to my education and to the education of all students who come after me. I would like to speak about what it would mean to cut a period from the middle school day. Mr. Simpson, my ELA teacher in sixth grade, is a great teacher. He had such a passion to teach everyone at their best level. He would come in early and stay late to make sure everyone could learn at their best. He would dedicate the extra period to making sure that every student who wanted to had the opportunity to do their best. Without this extra period, I would have fallen behind because the curriculum is much harder in middle school than it was in elementary school. The extra period gave Mr. Simpson the needed time to teach the harder curriculum to all students. <coughs> now I will speak about the loss of foreign language in the middle school. The decision to continue foreign language at the middle school this year allowed me the opportunity to explore the Spanish language. This opportunity was transformative to my educative mindset. I found a love for learning about cultures and languages different than mine. 
I have found new confidence in my ability to understand a subject. I believe that I might have the ability to study the subject in AP level. If these cuts go through, I will no longer be able to continue my studies in 8th grade. Senora Barbera has developed an environment in her classroom that has allowed me to thrive in a love for learning. If this opportunity is taken away, this will be detrimental to me and all of the students who come after me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on the budget's proposed restructuring of the middle school model. I have watched these budget meetings on TV and feel strongly that my education will be inferior to those who have come before me and benefited from the current model if this budget is approved. Thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to share my thoughts with the school committee. Hi, I'm Rebecca Bailey. I'm at 17 Forest Glen Road. I have a three-year-old daughter. She's in preschool at Little Treasures. Um, and my husband and I moved to Reading six years ago, so she wasn't even born yet. And we, one of our top considerations was the school system. Everyone told us, we were looking in the area, and everyone said, oh, Reading has one of the best school districts around, that you should definitely look there. And we were so happy to find an affordable house and actually get into town. Um, and that was our focus. We didn't even have a kid yet. <laughs> and um, we just have felt really fortunate and then the more I hear about what's been going on, you know, I've only just started to pay attention because she's so little, but now that she's in preschool, we're starting to think, oh, kindergarten's coming up, and then here we go down this road. And um, I know a lot of other parents of young kids in town, like that's my circle, and everybody's starting to pay attention and hear these things, and a lot of people I know are saying, you know, we moved here for the schools, and I'm just so disappointed in the direction things are going. It just sounds like our kids are not going to have the opportunities that the older kids have had, and it sounds like it's been so wonderful for so long, and we're just fearful that our kids are not going to have those opportunities, and so I just would really, I want to echo some of the comments before about academics being so important. I was a band kid. I loved the marching band, you know, like I totally get, my sister was drama, you know, we, we were really involved in those kinds of extracurricular and they're so important, but really the academic, uh, to be prepared for the world that we're going to live in and, and, you know, to be contributing members of society, the academics are the most important thing and I really would ask you to consider the effect that this would have on the little ones that are coming up through the system next. Thank you. Jeffrey Corrin, I live on Ridge Road. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak and for the, the hours that you've put in uh, reviewing the budget and thinking about the trade-offs and the difficulties. Um, and I understand that there are really no easy answers to this given the, the financial constraints that the town lives under. But I am concerned that foreign language has such a particular task here such a, a long-term effect that if you take them away one year, it's so difficult to put that back. And I, I would ask you to look at, are there other things where we can spread the pain around a little more? Maybe if, if the override for some reason doesn't go through, if something you know comes up and it just doesn't, you know, what is it that we might really, I mean, are you really prepared to be the school committee that voted to eliminate that foreign language? Or would you rather say, okay, we can't do without that? In the front because it's such a ripple effect, but maybe we could see a little pain next year um, that's much easier to recover from after one year. That it's not the easy explanation is foreign language, and you can sell that a little easier, but to, to the voters, to say this is the one chunk, but if you spread it out somehow to take pieces out, it's maybe a little more complicated story to tell, but um, it's just the concern that, uh, that the, even the seventh graders here have been speaking about is that the repercussions of this extend much further than, than one year of cuts. And, and I hope you can find some other way to help our schools. Thank you. Um, move to approve the consent agenda. 
second. I second it. All those in favor? Yeah, John, did you want to do anything before we... Do you have any presentation before we... Um, yes. I just wanted to recap a couple of things from the other evening. So the other evening, we presented to the committee um, some adjustments to the balanced budget based on some additional questions that we received and also um, we had the ability to take a look at um, a couple of areas that uh, we did not have full information on when we developed the budget in November, most notably the kindergarten enrollment, which we did not know until late December. So as you know in the budget we are proposing an increase of uh, one kindergarten teacher to address the increase in kindergarten enrollment for next year. We're up to 317 students at this point, which is an increase of over 30 students from, um, from this current year and 40 students from two years ago. So we are able to, um, because of the increased uh, tuition that's coming in, we're able to increase the kindergarten revolving offset by 0.5 of a teacher. And I just want to remind the committee that we cannot take a full teacher's salary offset because we are required by state law to provide half-day kindergarten. So the most we can take for a salary is the half of a teacher's salary, not the full salary. The same with the kindergarten paraeducators. There are two FTE kindergarten paraeducators in the budget. Um, for, so if we are able to take half of that amount, it's $19,000. That's a total of $49,000. We reviewed the drama stipends, which is increased this year by $20,000. Um, that was a review of historical, um, why the increase happened. And so we are proposing a decrease of $10,000. You can't decrease that line item more than that because those stipends are contractual for a total of $59,000. So our proposal with this adjustment to the balanced budget is to decrease the reductions that we had of the 4.0 elementary teachers to decrease it by one so that the new reduction would be 3.0 FTE kindergarten teachers, I mean uh, elementary teachers. So this would be the new, if, if uh, this is the recommendation that this, the committee votes on, um, this reflects the add back of one elementary teacher, $59,000, which that number was from the last slide. So you would see a change in the reductions of the regular day budget for three FTE elementary teachers. The total at the bottom would now change to 12 FTE for a total reduction of FTEs of $723,236. When you take a look at the full um, by uh, expenditures by cost center, um, you see the changes that are made in two cost centers. One is regular day. There would actually be a slight bump up of $59,000 in regular day and a decrease of $10,000 in district-wide programs. So we just wanted to, th this was the final slides that we proposed to the committee the other evening and that's why we want to give you that as a starting point. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? They'd like to uh, start the conversation on the FY19 budget. Anyone have any? Want to start it off? Blaine? I'll just start off by saying that um, I think what we're talking about here is <clears throat> unfortunately where we're, where we're going to put or not put the guillotine because that's what this is. I appreciate um, Jeffrey, I spoke last. Um, people are talking about athletics. This is my 11th or 12th year serving on the committee. 
And um, this is our fifth year cutting the budget. Um, so when we cut the, when we made the cuts last year, at the last minute we came up with some idea of adding it back. And when we did that, we said, we're going to be here again next year unless we pass an override. We didn't pass the override. Nobody designed Prop 2 and a half with the thought that a community that has a 98% residential tax base was not going to pass an override on the 2 and a half cap for 15 years. That's, we want to know why we're in this position and why it hurts us so much. We've got two committee members here who have kids in the middle school. My kids are out, but this terrifies me. So we have been spending months looking at this and I think if you, Jeffries, it could, could we, could we perhaps spread it? Even the athletics, you've got to cut almost the whole athletic program out. And you realize if you cut JV, you have no varsity. You just can't do that. You can't just cut a girl's sport or a boy's sport. You've got to cut them both. You've got to follow the law. So it's not about distributing it. It's about doing what we need to do for this community. This is the hardest job. I, I, can't, I, I don't know why, I know why there's not a lot of people running to do these jobs because they're too difficult. And we're really sorry, but it's not, it's not about, you know, exactly where this cut is. It's a big cut. We've been making big cuts all along. And we could cut the, almost the entire athletic program out and sit here and argue about which which varsity sport remains. If we save varsity football, is that, what are we going to do with that? We just have a varsity football team. You know how many kids? 1,200 kids participate, or 12, they, they, it's not all individual children because many children participate in multiple sports. And I understand that it's not the academic, but I can say unequivocally that one of my four sons would not have made it effectively through this school without his participation in wrestling. He would not have done it. It was that participation in wrestling and those coaches that inspired him and helped him. And he took, a, unbeknownst to me, he did actually establish a good foundation at this high school, though you wouldn't have known it. But that wrestling taught him discipline and confidence. It taught him to be who he was. <coughs> we are just playing games here, stripping things out of this district. It is time for this community to stand up. It's going to be a long night. But the bottom line is we have to stand up for an override. People have been asking me the question, what if it fails? And that's why Jeffrey's proposing, should we, could we wiggle it? Could we do something here? Could we do something there? The bottom line is we have to pass it. That has to be it. We can't do this anymore. I, I, I'm, my kids had great opportunity here. My husband's grandfather, his father, his mother, him, his brothers, sisters, myself, all of our children have gone to Reading High. Even one came back from private school because Reading is better. But we have to keep it better. This is going to be painful and there's no, no one that's not going to hurt at the end of tonight. Thank you. Jane? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> Over the last few weeks, obviously, I've done a lot of reading. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Over the last uh, s several weeks, I've obviously, along with my colleagues, along with all of you, done a lot of thinking, a lot of reading, a lot of reflecting um, on the future of our schools. And if there's one thing that I feel in all the conversations with parents, with teachers, everyone who's come out to speak, students, students, parents, teachers, residents, taxpayers, there's one thing that is unanimous Everyone thinks this is a bad budget. It's not good for kids. It will hurt the children of this community. I have not heard anyone say anything other than that. That is one area where there seems to be 100% agreement, and I stand in agreement with that. It's already been stated, but I think it is worth repeating that 7th and 8th grade ELA MCAS scores are among the strongest in our district, and in some cases, our 7th and 8th graders in Reading are scoring on their ELA MCAS at, an, at the top of our peer district, and we have a competitive peer district. We have areas in our school district that are well discussed on this committee that we need to work on, but that's not one of them. That is a huge strength, and I have to believe it's because our 6th graders get two blocks of ELA every day in 6th grade. That is not typical. It's very scary to think about what it looks like without it. 
I won't repeat everything that's been said about the value of foreign language in the middle school, but I stand completely with it. Everyone is exactly right. It's absolutely vital to have that. Um, as my colleague just said, we also have to present a budget that's sustainable. I, I think a, a parent, a, a, a parent made the comment, and she was exactly right. We cannot do this every year. We can't do it to our kids. We can't do it to the parents of this community, and we really should not do it to our staff. We cannot do something that is unsustainable. We need something where everyone can say, okay, this is how the schools look. So whatever we do needs to be sustainable. Um, I would point out that the middle school language problem, those cuts, come to just shy of $500,000. So we as a committee, would have to find $500,000 of other cuts in this budget that would be l less painful for kids. So if you, uh, many of you were engaged last year, you saw us go through that process. We looked at the administration. We looked at athletics. We looked at extracurriculars. We looked at art and music. I personally have done it again this year. I am open to any and all possible solutions to this problem. I am one of the committee members that has students at this level. I have a fourth and a seventh grader, so I assure everyone in this room that I do not need any motivation to solve this problem. I'm desperate to solve this problem. Last year, I determined that the only solution for a community like Reading was an override. It's where I still am. I continue to say I, I don't want to support an override. I don't want to advocate for an override. I see no other path forward. I continue to have an open mind, and I want to have a good discussion here tonight. Um, but whatever we come up with has to be sustainable, and that's a very big hole to fill. Um, thank you. Thank you. I should just uh, clarify, uh, and, and I don't think you meant it, but just, and I think Gene might have just said, the override was prior to last year's budget. It wasn't, we mm -hmm. didn't cut last year's mm -hmm. budget as a result of right. So it, we went into that knowing that we didn't get an override for that year. Yes. This year, uh, you know, we've we've uh, turned the process around where uh, the the override vote would follow uh, follow the the balanced budget that we passed <coughs> and the override budget. So we passed. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Wait. Uh, I have a number of things I really feel like I need to say. I look out here at each of you, and I am so proud of my community coming out, speaking their minds, and appreciating how important our kids' education is to our students, to our town, to our teachers who give so much. Um, thank you. Uh, each student that has spoken has just resoundingly reinforced how proud I am of our education system. I have three children who have graduated from Reading, and each of them is very different, and each of them has learned how to make their way and is succeeding in college and beyond, and I'm eternally grateful to Reading for that. Um, and I really feel like Two and a half works against us, Prop two and a half. Um, to be sitting in this seat, I was working on something today saying, okay, two years from now, do I want to be in this seat again, making these decisions that I feel so terrible about? I, it, there's just, our kids deserve better, and our town deserves better, and our future needs better. I appreciate that people are searching for those cuts that we can make that would compensate for or, or replace the cuts of the middle school language, and I've been looking for those. But when I think of athletics, I think, okay, that's off a revolving account. So even if we cut athletics, we can't, we stop getting money that pays, helps pays, pay for those sports. And then we're sending our kids out into the street without learning the discipline, the teamwork, having the, the um, physical outlets, and not having tools to fight the anxiety that we all see rising in our community. How can we cut the athletics? And then I think, okay, another extracurricular drama. 
that provides an outlet, a community, a family, skills. We don't have home ec or industrial arts anymore. Mm. We don't learn audio, uh, sound um, engineering, but they do in these. And I know so many of, of our children that have gone on into careers that are related to that, whether it's communications or drama or related to music industry or just learning how to speak and having the confidence to be out in front of people. It's not an expendable, uh, an expendable part of our education. Nor is debate club, nor is science club, nor is, the, it, there's nothing that's really expendable here and nor is foreign language. And neither are the, ele the elementary teachers. Um, and nor is the middle school model. And I feel intensely committed to our middle school model. I saw what it was like in other communities without that. I grew up without it. And the fact that in middle school, as opposed to our, my, my, uh, when the dinosaurs wandered outside the windows mm -hmm. and we had the junior high model, mm -hmm. In middle school, the kids are the focus. The teachers group in teams that all know the same children and discuss those children and their needs as they interact with the academic disciplines. It's a completely different focus. And if we don't look towards preserving that model, then our kids lose even more, and so does our community, and so does our future. So I hate to support this cut of foreign language teachers, and I know many of them personally, and this is not personal. It's awful. And so I, too, support this override. I see no option. Two and a half, Prop two and a half was not meant, as to quote my colleagues, wasn't meant to last 15 years, 13 years, 15 years. And when a school system cuts for five years, there's no fat left to cut. There's no programs that are superfluous. And I agree wholeheartedly. I appreciate everything people said. I hate having to support this budget. But we share this responsibility. And I hope I'm not the only one out there trying to educate about what our town needs. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Blum. So, I wanted to touch on three things right now. One is what our job is here tonight as a committee. Second, how we got here, as, as I see it. And third, some ideas of where we could go and have some specific proposals for the committee to consider. The job tonight, as I see it, and as I understand it, is for the six of us to vote on a, a budget for the FY19 school year. That's a one-year budget. We have a proposal that we're considering, but you know, we, we as a committee need to vote a budget by the end of tonight. Secondly, we have a discussion around a request for an override to the select board. That's a request for additional funds from the taxpayer that would accrue year over year over year if passed. And ultimately, responsibility for that is not with this board only. Our job is to decide if we want to make such a request and what's going to go into that request for the taxpayers. So there's two parts. So the first part is one year. The second part is year over year over year over year if the taxpayers decide and the selectmen decide to put an override and not the tax voted um, favorably by the voter. Okay. So then the question is, what do we put in the one year bucket, FY19, and what do we put in the request for override year over year if, if we decide to do that? So I'll, I'll speak to that in the proposal that I have at the end. Um, the question about how we got here, um, you know, there, there are some numbers that I think are helpful for anybody asking that question. I'll just touch on them briefly. They're in the, um, the, rec the responses that were circulated to the school committee questions. Um, in short, um, we've had school committee budgets that you know, go up between 1.4 and 4.2 percent, fairly modest. Um, and, and in the past five years, we've removed $3.4 million out of our schools. 3.4 million, that's what we've taken out, according to the handouts we've seen. The uh, level service, that's what it costs to continue to run the Reading Public Schools without making any cuts. That stayed between 4.9 and 5.2% for the last five years. Right. 
So that gap, I think, is, is appropriate to discuss in the context of an override request. Come back to that later. Proposals. So a couple of my colleagues just asked for suggestions, and I'm going to make a few here. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a slide to show you, but let me talk about the, um, the middle school restructuring. I'm going to call it. That's $485,880, a little shy of $490,000, just under $500,000. I want to talk just briefly of, of how I view that cut, and, and I first of all I want to say that you know everything in the, that we're cutting has educational benefit. I believe that um, as a school committee member, all the things that we're talking about cutting benefit student learning, and they benefit teachers in the classroom, they benefit benefit administration who are helping the teachers. So I, I don't have any doubts about that. That you can make a case for everything. There are some unique features about this middle school restructuring, for me looking at it, that are unique to this restructuring proposal. It's an all or nothing proposal. It's seven FTE, so seven uh, teachers. It does three things in the classroom. And please correct me if I'm wrong, raise your hand or something, but I think this is from my notes. This is what I heard from our public uh, hearings. Uh, it's about a 50% reduction in student time. There's a slight, I say approximately, because this class period get a little longer, but you're cutting out one out of two periods that students have in English language arts, and obviously we all need to access language to access any curriculum, not just in English language arts. Second, uh, it eliminates all middle school foreign language, and a lot has been said about that. Uh, so no seventh and eighth grade language. Uh, third, it has an impact on when students can receive so-called pull-out services where they need to be removed from the classroom to receive additional support or um, help. So it does those three things to students. Uh, for the teachers, it doubles the number of students per ELA teacher. I think I heard that right. In sixth grade. In, in sixth grade. Thank you. Um, it's unprecedented in 30 years. Uh, Dr. Dart has been here over 30 years at RPS, and, and we've had this, this double language block for a long time. Uh, it is out of step with our peer community districts, as we heard in comments tonight. Um, basically, if you want to get a middle school education in this area of Massachusetts in our peer districts, you can have seventh and eighth grade language elsewhere. Um, and then I want to talk last about potential impact on high school readiness and state assessments. I did look at the November 6th, 2017 school committee packet where um, you know, Craig Martin presented uh, the recent ELA assessments. And one of the things that I noticed is that we went from in fifth grade, uh, last uh, last year that we have data for, 2017, we went from meeting or exceeding expectation in English language arts a little over 50% of the time in fifth grade. In sixth grade, that jumped to 65%. In seventh grade, that jumped to 74%. So you can see that, you know, I, I don't know why that is, it just is empirically, right? We could argue about why that is and how much of a straight line there is to this double language period, but it just is, that is a fact. Uh, and in high school, we're at 95%. Um, at or uh, advanced or proficient in English language arts. So there's something about these years between elementary school and high school and how we do it here in Reading that, you know, to my eye, is working. So to me, those are, those are characteristics that I think are unique to these cuts uh, to the middle school. So for proposals, here's an idea. So the numbers have moved around some. Um, because of the adjustments tonight um, based on kindergarten enrollment and so forth, but I'll lay out the, there's about three or four basic pieces. Um, one piece would be to look at the 49,000 or so that I believe remains for the increases in the full day kindergarten program and look at whether we can fund that out of uh, additional user fee increases and discuss how much that might be. So that is a proposal to take off uh, some of that cost. Uh, second, removing the data coach from the FY19 budget. That's a savings of 66000 while retaining the other restructuring that was detailed in the budget book for that position. So that's 66 more thousand toward our 485 um, that we need. Uh, third, remove funding for a school business assistant or fund that by additional cuts to administration. Uh, fourth, uh, restore drama stipends to FY18 levels. I think that's been done with a um, $10,000 cut there. Um, and then the last two pieces are, uh, these are the big ones. Um, one would be to restore athletics, the athletic area to the FY16 uh, funding level. It's 405771 uh, That's $198,000 less than what we have in the FY19 budget, so that's $200,000 uh, roughly. And lastly, the building-based budgets. Um, proposing something between 4% you know, cut in building budgets gives you $30,000 back. Um, you could envision a 10% cut, which would be 68000 
Um, some of that money, you know, we could discuss this, but at the end of the year, the school regenerates a certain amount of cash every year. Uh, for three out of the last four years, that amount has been in excess of $200,000. It is not always in excess of $200,000, but um, that pool of money um, that usually results from the fact that, as I understand it, we assume that we'll have 0% turnover in the district over the course of a year. If we challenge that assumption and, and have a different assumption in this budget, you could, I believe, regain some, uh, some of the building-based budgets back, if not all of them. So that's a proposal I had it written down here, but I'm sure there'll be a lively discussion on this point. Thanks. Mr. Yes. Can I just ask a point of clarification on that? Yes. It, it's a very quick factual point. Yep. Mr. Bravin, can you go through those five items again and give the dollar amounts that you're proposing? Yeah. Well, the, the challenge here, uh, Jeannie, is that the numbers moved a little bit tonight, but I'll give you the okay. dollars that I had. And yeah, please. They should be within an order of. Yeah, they, they should be. So, uh, absolutely. So, the, the middle school restructuring is 485,880. Yep. Right? So, we should agree on that. Um, originally, the kindergarten uh, paralegal plus at two FTE and the one FTE kindergarten teacher was 98,000. We just heard tonight there's, I think that number is cut in half to 49,000. Is that, did I understand that correctly? You, you can't use an offset of the whole salary because we are required to provide half the kindergarten. I understand, but does the, does the reduction that you presented tonight account for only the part of those funds that are needed for the half day that's required. Yes, it does. Forty-nine thousand. So, so forty-nine. So forty-nine thousand uh, there. Data coach sixty-six thousand. Okay. Um, school business assistant seventy thousand. Reduction in uh, drama stipends. I originally had that at nineteen four sixty-five to eliminate the increase. But there's been a ten thousand dollar reduction in that number, so I think that's an additional ninety four sixty five, Gene. Okay. Um, and then the building based budget, I had it at four percent for twenty nine nine ninety eight. At four percent, and I'm proposing based on the adjustments we've made tonight, we could raise that higher. I'm proposing we can go as high. As, in my mind, my proposal would be as high as ten percent, which would be a sixty eight thousand dollar. Twitter goal. And then the big one is the athletics, and that's taking us back to FY16 actual spend. So it's turning the clock back three fiscal years. That's so 198, that's 198,000. The only one I didn't get was the drama, the drama stipends total was 10,000. Thank you. Yeah. 10,000. Okay. What was the athletic? 200. So it's 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 reducing athletics from 604 to 57. That's in figure 32. To 405. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Lane's right. 405 771. So I can give you the exact number. It is um, Jean, it is 198,486 dollars. What? What was the building based budget then? You know, so it, yeah. That by 10 percent. It would be the difference to. 10% max is as high as I would propose. Um, I would propose something between 4 and 10%. 4% is about 30,000. 10% is about 68,000. Was it one year? Yeah. So the sum of of all the parts below 485 equals 485, roughly? It should equal roughly 485. And again, the numbers moved around, so I'm trying to make the changes on the spot, which is always dangerous. Um, they added up neatly from the numbers we had a few nights ago when I did this analysis. So. I'm sure somebody can add them up for me. So, the, uh, but the, the levers to pull here, just at a, at a high level, where, where I think there's a lot of flexibility for the committee to consider is, you know, if we want to make a cut to building-based budgets, we made a hundred thousand dollar cut last year. I believe a lot of that was actually funded from uh, sources such as, you know, turnover um, and people leaving the district, waiting with an open position that you're not paying for, and then hiring a replacement. So. So just the one thing, I know we spent a lot of time at previous meetings talking about this, um, is, you know, we, we have, when we have needs in special education, we have to provide for those needs. Mm -hmm. And we've been basically shifting the relationship between the regular day and special education. And all of these things, or these things, uh, the um, building-based budgets, um, reducing those further really goes towards, that supports all students, but certainly it has probably an even bigger impact on regular day. Um, I 
think we've heard from, we heard from, I think, every principal um, here, either in prior school committee meetings or in these budget discussions about, um, again, the data coach, the value of the data coach in helping our teachers to access what student needs are around learning. And we keep, you know, we keep peeling away at the things that support our, our district. <coughs> And you know, last night we or the two nights ago we heard I think that some of the teachers and principals <coughs> talk about um, some assistant principals our, our our situation with that and what that means they can't do in their buildings. So um, I and I think Mr. Mr. Robinson asked um, Mrs. Dowd to just try to help us understand if we were to go back to the. Um, FY16 level of athletic funding of 405,000 that we would have to incre increase fees and we can't really, it's, this is obviously you've been here with us in this time and Mrs. Dowd is sort of giving her best look at it. Yeah, it's very, very rough. I just asked her a few minutes ago. So. <laughs> Back of the envelope calculation. So you decide what you think the error rate would be but it could be as high as a $200 increase. Now we you know, we increased the fees last year, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Per, per, per athletic participation. So again, we more we shift fees, we shift to fees. We're privatizing this public education. Yes, please. Uh, this is very aligned to what Mrs. Webb was just saying. If you look at, um, and I'm on page 48 of the budget book, figure 32. Yeah. If you look at revolving fund support since FY15 for the athletics budget, F, um, sorry, 15. Mm -hmm. FY16, we had our highest rate of revolving fund support. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest, and my memory, is that that was an unsustainable level of offset. That that would draw down that account and not be sustainable. And I think the thinking at the time was um, for, I don't know what the thinking was at the time, I'd have to go back to my notes and my records, but I do think that that's an artificially low number and, and, and um, I think it's an artificially low number to tie back to. And I think so because the offset we used that year was quite out of line with what you can see we've done in previous years. So can I, I just want to clarify, well, you weren't propose, you were not proposing increasing an offset, were you? Or so no. you, I, it's, it's just a flat out cut, and it's going to affect the people in, that benefit from those funds. There's no doubt about that. And I think as a committee, we generally instruct to the cost center guidance, and, and the administration decides how best to recommend to us how to implement that. But it, a $200,000 cut is, is definitely going to be felt. It does have a benchmark in the past. And I understand that a large part of that benchmark, in fact, so roughly 50K over the year before that, when I'm looking at that right here. Yeah. 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 No, that, that was very high. And then, you know, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of complexity to understanding revolving accounts and how they, you know, as we talked about the other night, that they're highly regulated money, so we don't have a lot of discretion there and what the offset is or isn't. It depends on participation and, and other factors. But no, this, this, I was just trying to tie it to a benchmark, but this, this would be felt that the impact on those affected would undoubtedly be higher than in FY16. It's a great point. So, just, I, I applaud you for putting this together. Thank you. Uh, is that on? Yeah. I did something similar last year, and I think it was Mrs. Lieberman said, we're, we're here every year doing this. I mean, if we get behind something like this, we're going to be back here again next year looking for, if, if the override doesn't pass, uh, looking for, uh, you know, other ways to do it. I mean, I've been uh, struggling with this for weeks and trying to, I have ideas, but I, they're, they take the focus off of, of what we need to do and that's uh, infuse more money into our education system through an override. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, so I guess, I, again, I, I appreciate and, you know, applaud you for doing this. I guess I'm just concerned that, uh, you know, we, the community won't believe us when we say that the budgets uh, are, are shortfalls every year if, if we uh, keep coming up with 
things that we need to always put the caveat at the end, and I think it was in Ms. Borowski's budget message last year, the caveat at the end that this is a one-time fix, and we're going to be back here again next year. And, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, it's dividing the community uh, by having these uh, uh, conversations about, I mean, no, no one up here wants to cut uh, middle school foreign language. No one wants to cut athletics. I mean, there's all, and believe me, we say we're cutting athletics, there's going to be just as many people in this room complaining, or not complaining, that's the wrong word, uh, but speaking passionately about that as there are about foreign language. Believe me, especially when you have over 90% participation in athletics. Uh, so, uh, I'm just rambling on here. I don't have a, a solution. I guess I'm just uh, trying to, you know, trying to, maybe it's time to put the brakes on, see what happens with the override. And, uh, you know, I'm not comfortable passing this budget, uh, the uh, superintendent's recommended budget. And, uh, but, you know, I, I think at some point we, you know, we got to stop, uh, you know, coming up with one year fixes. Thanks. So, yes. But um, Mr. Bond's proposals, I think, still re would require us to, we'd still be short about $200,000. No, that's so what, the athletic, uh, mm -hmm. the they, athletic in the going back to 2000, oh. what was it, 16 levels mm -hmm. infused okay. uh, uh, another cut of okay. 100 million. I think we are we having audio problems. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay, which is it in the room or is it RCTV or? I believe it's RCTV. Oh, it's no. probably at the studio. Okay. Oh, so they're not picking up no. these mics here. Okay. We've got green lights on our mics, so there's yeah. no. Correct. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Doxter. Oh, hi, Rob. So my recording is fine. I'm picking up everything that you guys are saying on the recording. There's an issue with the audio going live, so people at home can't really hear you right now. I have someone at the studio working on it, but our recording is fine. I can hear you guys fine, so in any event... You can watch it tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> people who are watching should come here. Yes. Come on down. I can't hear you. <laughs> we need but, uh, captioning, I think. Our is fine, so if it is tomorrow, you can people at home will be able to rewatch this. Um, we're working on it, though. That's what I can do. Can anybody sign that? Come here. The audio is good in the room, because I don't know sign language. Captioning. Yeah. Dr. Doxter. Thank you. Um, I got an email that people were having trouble hearing, so I'm rather hyper about making sure. So I'm glad that this is being recorded anyways. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank Nick, for Mr. Boyven, for coming up with um, thinking creatively. And I really want to thank uh, Mrs. Dowd and the superintendent and our leadership in the town for working so hard together to come up with the budget that we have been looking at and tearing apart and trying to figure out for the last two months. Um, so a big thank you. I want to confront sort of an illusion in the room and the illusion is that our taxes are paying for all of our educational needs. Every school committee meeting, we vote on a consensus budget and a, con consent. a consent agenda. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, and every meeting, we see the generosity of people in our community, whether it's through the athletic teams providing, raising the money to pay for their assistant coaches and the extra leadership that they need, because we don't pay for that. They do. We pay for coaches, but we don't pay for the support staff. They do. They're already raising the money for that for their kids. Our taxes aren't paying for those, for a lot of that. Likewise for the science teams. Likewise for other needs in our district. And likewise, our business administrator, Mrs. Dowd, has been not only doing her job, but also the job of an assistant. She has grants. 
our leadership has written and received grants, and those grants are paying for important programs in our town, and those grants require management, administration, and so on top of doing all the other work, she needs to do the management of those grants. There's only so long someone can do two jobs. And what happens if, someone, if she gets sick? Sorry, I don't wish this. <laughs> but, <laughs> she's she's she working hard she now. Home. <laughs> but my point is that we have no extra administration. That people are doing all they can and there's no backup if there's a gap. We've been told that in these discussions. So cutting the business administrator it was in sounds like you're lessening the demand on our teachers, but we're also lessening the resources for our district. And so as much as I want to restore the seven teachers and the four teachers and the tutors, this budget has been worked on, and I don't see that as an out like I see addressing the real issue here, which is we can't keep cutting, and we're not finding money. We're just cutting something else that's important, and that's the message. We can't keep cutting programs that are important so that next year, as it was said, we're dealing with the same thing over again. We're not getting anything back. We're just cutting and cutting and cutting. And the meat is now on the cutting room floor. And that's not fair to the people that are working with our students or to our students. Could you have? So, thank you. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Yes, thanks so much, Nick, and everybody else. So I had a couple of questions about some of your proposals um, that, so I can understand better as I weigh this. One of my questions is about the business, administ uh, the business assistant in that um, I was under the, I, maybe it's optimistic as a teacher advocating for administration, which is an unusual position to be in for me as a teacher. But um, the business assistant, one of the things I heard also is that that position might, I mean, we're not going to say did it pay for itself exactly, but that our district is losing opportunities for funding, perhaps, through the Medicare reimbursements. Mm -hmm. And um, so I forgot what else. There was another thing, too, for, for that we're just, we feel like we're not being as aggressive about getting Reimbursements, is there that correct? Are, there are additional yeah. items we can look into for Medicaid reimbursement, but there we would have to make decisions either not to pursue current grant funding in order to look at that. There's also opportunities to look at E-rate reimbursement through the government. They have multi-year programs, and those are items right now. It is determining which, if we want to continue with the current grant funding mm -hmm. or cease current funding and look at other opportunities so there isn't enough capacity to take on additional avenues such as that. I mean because obviously I, Mr. Boyven I think brought up the other day too how important anything we do it's how important it is for it to be sustainable and so I guess I look at that position as adding to our sustainability and so um, I'm a little reluctant <coughs> to, to cut that one at this point. Um, as far as the turnovers, the salary savings, that's, that's a biggie. <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, so I heard that right now, I read in the questions uh, and answers, we're looking at, as far as we know, we have four people we're expecting retiring. retiring but it, there'll be some more. But one of my concerns, oh, please, okay, Dr. Doherty, do you want to go or do you want me to finish my question? No, I was just going to clarify. Okay. So we, we currently have four, ret four retirements. Mm -hmm. One we've already actually captured in the reductions. Right. So that one is already in the elementary teacher reductions. I see. The other three that are retirements are highly specialized positions that we are going to get very little turnover savings on. Okay. Um, I haven't studied this enough, so I rely on you to give me, to give some clarification, but we have had a fair amount of turnover and it sounds like our teaching, the age of our teaching um, staff is younger. Is that probably accurate? We, um, yes, that, that is, it is, 
there are more, uh, probably a better way to, yeah. we have more teachers on the salary schedule than on the top step. So yes, that would indicate that we have a less veteran staff. Correct. A less veteran staff. Yes. I think that's, and I, I, that concerns me a lot. I mean, if this cut would lock us into um, having to only look at people in that salary band, um, I don't know our district terminology well enough yet, that concerns me too because I think to have a healthy teaching staff um, I think, you know, a lot of times the teachers coming in from college have a lot of tech savvy and ideas and energy. The more veteran teachers tend to have classroom management and great pedagogy and that you need, though, you need to have teachers at every kind of level, I think, to have a mentorship program. I'd be concerned, too, if we have too many at this lower and this lower staff position, are you going to have a bubble of people going up? in columns or you know it could really have weird financial implications down the line um, I'm concerned too that when I look at um, like when you want to put a team together like say you need for example five fifth grade teachers or five in a school you might want to hire one that has particular expertise in science one that has expertise in English, one that has expertise in math, so that you have a strong team approach. And so I, I guess I'm a little concerned that if we're going to rely on this turnover salary savings, I'd want to know more about the possible implications of our, um, I, I'll use the word faculty, um, composition as a result. So, thanks. Yes, Thank you. <clears throat> and I did have, I'm not quite finished though. I do, I just thought maybe you were going to. Did you want me to reply? I don't know if you want me to reply or just want me to, I have another Mr. question. Mr. Robinson, do you want me to reply? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, if, if this is an area, a direction that the committee wants to pursue, um, it is going to, it is going to challenge us in hiring um, the best candidates for each position because now we're in a situation where Mrs. Dowd and I are going to have to work with each building principal and every position it becomes vacant. Every position. And we're not just talking about teachers, we're talking about administrators, paraeducators, any position. And we're going to have to set a salary level, which we've never had to do before because we've basically told our principals <coughs> And we've, we've always been under the direction, hire the best people for the positions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those positions come in higher than the person that's leaving, sometimes they come in lower. But if we're going to now take that delta and we're going to assume that that's gonna be part of this, this budget, then we're going, it's going to change the way we hire. And it also means that positions will be left unfilled for a while. Because if I have a, and I'm going to use a special education teacher because that seems to be the ones that we, you know, speech and language. Because that, that was real, that happened this year. That speech and language positions are very difficult to fill. And if now we're going to have to put thresholds of salary on it, they're going to be even more difficult to fill. So, I, again, I, I would have to look at our teacher kind of faculty composition on this, but I worry about sustainability on that one as well because um, I think that this number also <coughs> assumes we have a lot of people at higher rates retiring or leaving and we can always hire at lower. At some point if our faculty and our administrators are all kind of new on the scale, they might stay longer so there wouldn't be as much turnover plus it would be an apple for an apple at some point. So, and I don't know where we'd hit that point. I don't know if we could, ha could count on that kind of savings for one year, two years, three years, but at some point we're gonna have to think about that. The athletics one concerns me a little bit. I, I uh, teach for Springfield College. We're big on body, mind, spirit, and holistic living. Um, but I'm really concerned about it also in terms of community. Um, I'm really worried in our community at the divides in it. 
And I look at athletics and drama as areas where our families really come together and work together, not only to go to the shows, but in the booster clubs, in the coaching, in the watching the games. And I am concerned, although it's an intangible, at the impact on kind of community building and community orientation of that one. I'm also concerned that if fees do have to go up, of course, we're going to have more students who can't afford it, so I, I worry about that. And I guess I would just plead with the community. I think for myself, I, instead of paying an extra $200 for my daughter to do fall track, and then another $200 for her to do spring track, and another $200 for my son to do the same, and another $200, that $800 extra I'd be paying in a family, for, one, for my kids to do one sport, I could instead invest that in this community and I could support our firefighters and our police and our public works people and I could invest in our whole community for my child instead of in that one sport for my child. So that one concerns me too. But, you know, obviously the fact you made this proposal and you spent the time doing this is just an indication again of the commitment everybody up here in front of you has to the language program, the middle school program, and wanting to do what's right by kids. So although this is tough and we don't always agree, I think it's clear that our common ground and our commitment is, is the same. So thank you. Ms. Borowski. Thank you. Um, I, I agree um, with everyone who's applauded the creativity. Oops, sorry. I agree with everybody who's applauded the creativity of these proposals. So thank you, Mr. Blotham, for, for coming up with an alternative to consider. Um, I do have some concerns about some of the proposed cuts, so I just want to share them with the committee as we're hashing this out. Um, the data coach, in my mind, as long as we have a level three district, a level three school in this district, we need to be very careful about cutting the only data analyst position we have because I think it's connected to solving that problem. The building-based budget, a 10% cut, in order to make that work, that needs to be a permanent cut. So our principals would have to manage their buildings on 10% less than they have every year. That strikes me as unsustainable, particularly where last year I asked about that and said, have those been going up? And the per people, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Doherty, but my memory from last budget cycle is that dollar hasn't gone up in your memory. That, so That's correct. So. Uh, to, to be clear for anyone watching at home, the principals get a, um, an amount of money to fund, to buy the things that their school <coughs> needs to run the school, right? And it's based on the number of kids in the building times a dollar amount. And so I asked the question, is that dollar amount going up every year for inflation? And the answer is no, it's not. Well, what that means over a 10-year period is they're actually getting less every year to manage their school. So to propose a 10% cut on top of that and make it permanent is deeply concerning and I'm not sure realistic. Um, the, so two final points on this proposal. The athletics budget. This is our second public hearing and this is a new idea. And we don't know what the student impact will be because I, I think your proposal is to just cut uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of a third of the athletics budget and ask the administration to figure out how to solve it. It strikes me that that could be really impactful to students like whole, I don't know what the impact. That's actually part of the problem. I don't know what the impact would be. None of us know what the impact will be on students for a cut that large. And more problematic for me, we've had two public hearings and those kids and families never got a chance to advocate. So I, I am concerned that if we wanted to go down this road, we need an opportunity to hear from those parents who, who would have a right. I'd have to have a better sense of how this is gonna impact the kids. What's the impact um, on families and students? And I'd wanna hear more from them about that. My final point is, I think an important one for me. I don't know if anyone else in the committee, but for me, a priority over the last few years has been equity. It's been very painful, but I've wanted to make sure that we are as much as possible being fair in how we cut budgets. So we've cut somewhere in the neighborhood of six or seven FTEs at the elementary level over the last five years, and, and Dr. Doherty, correct me if I get this wrong, six there, or seven at the high school level. That's right, Here, here's the slide. Thank you. And this, this includes the change, proposed change. Thank you. Wait a second. I'm having trouble reading this. Slide. Oh, over the last, oh, we didn't go back what's the time, time period of this? It's process? the last, it's next year, this year, and last year. Yep. 
So um, I actually think if you go back another couple of years, that elementary, oh, that's because we added one back in. Gotcha. It was six. Now it's 5.6. Gotcha. Um, so my point of all of this in the slide, thank you for putting that up there, is that we have managed to increase elementary class sizes, reduce sections at the high school, reduce options for our students at the high school, and we have not gone, we haven't looked at the middle school because because of the middle school model, you have to make a big cut. If we were to protect this program, we're hitting the high schoolers again for the fifth straight year, and I am concerned about equity. Uh, it's, it's, as everyone has said, nobody feels good about any of this, but if we have to do this, I think we have to think about fairness across the whole district. So that's another sort of thing that's in my mind as we debate this. So, uh, Dr. Dory, question uh, is the there's a 30% hold back now on the uh, per pupil. Is that what's proposed? We do that. We do that every year, and we release it. So would it be 30% of the number you had in your budget, or is that already reduced by the 30%? No, you know we held 30% of what their current per pupil budget is. Okay. It's still within the budget. What we do is we don't allow the principals to spend it at the beginning right. of the year until we're far enough in the year to ensure we can cover all of our, I don't want to say that they're not required and mandated, but until we're sure we can meet all others. And then we release it in the last three to four months of the year as we get further along. So we've always fortunately been able to release the hold back. Yes, Mr. So, just referring people to the question and answer packet that came out, was it last meeting, Chuck? Mm -hmm. Page uh, seven, figure eight. Dr. Darty and staff helpfully provided us with uh, eight years of the annual school budget returned back to free cash. It's all that we generated, I believe, in the financial. So, I mean, I, I would just point out in seven in the last eight years, we've had at least. 60,000, which is a 10% cut in the building based budgets. This past year, we had 451,000. Right? Oh, this was on the um, budget. Obviously, these numbers fluctuate wildly, right? Because we, you know, we do our best to estimate what costs and demands are going to be. We have legal mandates in, in some areas, and we have to fulfill those no matter what. Um, I would also point out that there are multiple town meetings during a fiscal year. And as as much as we have never, that I know of, been, at least in the years represented here, and people can correct me, gone back to town meeting to ask for money other than for, I think, the science curriculum last year. The building base, another option this committee could consider is asking town meeting for money for building based budgets or other things. Uh, you know, during the school year where these building based budgets, if cut, to prove insufficient. Um, so, in, in question nine, my other point on this page is, is on the response below. Question eight, question nine states that the proposed budget does not include a rate of employee turnover. So it's part of the reason why, because we make safe assumptions in that regard, and there's good reason as the superintendent just articulated to do that. Um, I think an option the committee could consider is challenging those assumptions and cutting the building based budget um, by you know, that proposal is. Between four and ten percent, ten percent, which we have sixty-eight thousand. Um, thank you. So, uh, I, I I understand what you're saying, and and you know agree with the the and the fact that we've done it in the past. Uh, my concern is uh, just the comment about going to town meeting. Uh, I'm comfortable going to town meeting for a one-time uh, item. I don't know whether, uh, and ju I'm just thinking out loud, I mean, it's not something we've done is go every year for what I would call an operating item as opposed to, you know, one-time curric, the science was a one-time curriculum purchase, uh, or, you know, I can remember years back when we had to replace a boiler at Kill them, uh, those, those types, of, uh, not a kill them at uh, Joshua Eaton. Joshua Eaton. Uh, so I hear hear that, but I just I'd have to think about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, uh, Elaine was. Um, so I, I've been a long time, time, 
town meeting member and many people in this room have been as well. And I think there's been a few times that I can recall that we've actually brought to town meeting floor as part of the budget process requests for some additional funding, I believe, for a health curriculum at one point in time. Um, can't remember the other one, but um, I can remember literally hours and not getting to sign die and never getting the money. No matter how passionately people felt about the schools, town meeting was not willing to pass that for, you know, because it's not, it, it, in, in those cases, you know, it was in the midst of the, the uh, first, I guess, opioid crisis, the eighth, eight heroin deaths that the community had and we were trying to put some health curriculum in place and you know it would have been an ongoing cost town meeting wasn't willing to do it so for you know that's not been my experience and when I look at this the budgets it's six out of eight years we were less than one percent returning less than one percent of a forty plus million dollar budget and I, I always this is this has always been a hard thing because we return money, and I'm not, I don't know all of the workings of the municipal budget, but quite often, uh, <coughs> at, and I know this year they did, they went back to FinCom for additional funding for overtime. I don't think it was snow and ice last year. I think it was just, uh, you know, there's some additional funding required to support some of the overtime that it took to support our community's safety. And we return, again, six out of eight years, less than 1%. I know that there's a very specific reason for F by 14, I can't remember it right now. It was a special. So, uh, but I always felt like it's like this is the no good deed goes unpunished thing. We work really, really, really hard. We, you know, do everything that we can, and then we return something that's reasonable. So maybe FY14 and 17 were too high. So next, this year is Gail's first entirely full year creating <laughs> budget and executing it. So we'll see, won't we? Um, but I, I, I don't, I, so I, John, what was the, the FY14 piece? That was very high. The, the majority of that was in out of district special education tuitions um, that we had <coughs> thought were going to come to fruition and did not. Okay. So it and was. Last year in 17, about half of it was in special mm -hmm. education. The other half was spread out over many, many account line items. Mm -hmm. And across all four cost centers. And all four cost centers. Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Barry Berman, um, Selectman. I want to comment a little bit on um, uh, figure eight, which is sort of the money that has been given back. Actually, um, Elaine, you, you touched on it too. Um, you know, school, school budget turned back to free cash over the last few years. On the municipal side, we do that as well. Um, so folks should really keep in mind that the budget book that these folks are working from and what we work from on the municipal budget side started to get put together really October of November of this past year for a budget that's going to take us through June 2019. So you're looking at 18, 19, 20 months. So trying to make a decision today that's going to last you 18, 19, 20 months down the road. Um, think of your own household budgets. How many of you know what you're going to wind up spending 18 months from now based on the data that you have today. A lot of things go into what's turning back a lot of this free cash. Some of it is um, we actually get more revenue than what we projected. Some one-time things or, or some, some, in fact, we're basing a budget for local aid and health insurance. We don't know the final number of any of those yet. So we're building a budget based on a lot of unknown facts. Um, so that's number one. Number two, sometimes there's actually cost savings. You want to you want to actually be rewarded for saving money, and the fact that the schools turn back money as well as the town government, it's actually prudent fiscal conservative budgeting. You don't want to run out of money. Town meeting is is done by the end of April. You don't want to run out of money and have to call a special town meeting because you budgeted too fine on your revenue numbers, and then have to call town meeting back to do money for this or that. I mean, FinCom has $150,000 reserve, so last year um, there was a, a firefighter overtime that had to get funded out of that. But you really don't want to create the budget so thin and so skinny and so conservative that you're going to run out of money. It's actually good that we're returning 
money back. It means that we're managing the taxpayer's money correctly. So to fund positions from this, you know, from the, you look at this bar graph, it's all over the place. You want to have some kind of sustainability in that and to rely on some things where maybe you're not going to have that money to do. You're going to hire them today and fire them tomorrow. That's just not right. You need to have a sustainable source of funds. Um, and I think looking at the fact that we actually turn money back, school committee as well as on the town side, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Thank you. Mr. Bois. Yeah, Barry, I really actually agree with what you're saying. And my, to be clear, my proposal is not to fund people with any of that. It, it is all over the map, but to Lane's point, it's actually even, Lane, I think I can make your point even stronger. Six out of eight years, we're under 1%, right? So we, we budgeted very close to the line, and it's like going to the moon and back and packing an Apollo space capsule, because what we decide tonight is gonna kick in, what, July? Of, of next summer, of this upcoming summer, and it's going to last us 12, well, 12 months, right? So this is a very difficult task, and I, and I think the administration does it really, really well to, to be within and under 1% margin with those types of estimates. Shows a lot of experience and a lot of thought goes into these estimates. My proposal is simply to look at that 30% holdback that we already have, which amounts to about $200,000 in stuff in the building page budget, which is important and necessary. We can't go without it. Um, my, my question is, what do you put at risk in the budget? And so what I'm proposing is, is that the building base cuts, if we were to adopt them, would be within an envelope that the, the, the committee was comfortable in looking at historical regenerated data in figure eight, saying that we're likely to get that money back based on the usual operation of a district this big, based on our past history. So definitely not funding people or FTE out of that money. I would, I would uh, support that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, quick comment and a memory from last year. At a Board of Selectmen's meeting, and I don't want to, to call you out, Mr. Berman, so correct me if I'm misquoting you, but I believe last year at one of these very difficult budget sessions, you made the analogy of rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Um, I, I'm sitting here listening to this discussion and it's resonating with Jean. me. Oh, sorry. Um, about a year ago, I believe I recall, and Mr. Merman, our, a member of our uh, Board of Selectmen, is saying that he also recalls, um, perhaps saying something along the lines of the activity that we're going through feels like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. And I'm having that sense. We're now discussing whether we should cut one third of high school athletics with no understanding of what that will do to entire teams being, I don't even know what that means. We literally do not know what that means. Slashing building-based budgets for our principals versus the middle school language program, that's where we're at. None of these options are, are good, and I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Mrs. Sanfi. <coughs> So what I wanted to comment on that I'm hearing is the recommendation that possibly a 4 to 10% range cut in building-based budgets. I'm a town meeting member and I would, am deeply, deeply disturbed about that because that means that, as you've heard, pe people will be coming to town meeting every year. That is not something that I would support. Um, I'm also deeply concerned about it because our building-based budgets are very, very, very thin. Thank you. Mr. Bob. To everyone's point there, I don't think there are any good options at this point. Um, so a couple points that haven't been made yet. In figure, I don't have the wrong thing there, cumulative budget, reductions in the circuit breaker account. Maybe somebody can help with that. There's, I wrote down a number, but I, someone can look at the table for me. I apologize. Uh, but the number I have is a $202,417 reduction in our state reimbursement for special ed programs uh, this year. And that, we have had reductions in the past. The last two years, that number has gone up. This year, it went down precipitously. Um, there's nothing, no history in the budget book it's 39, uh, it Nick, you had. Yeah, figure 39, thank you. I apologize to everyone being quick on my feet there. Um, so yeah, it's on figure 39, page 54 of the budget book, Circuit Breaker, which is the state reimbursement, one of the state partial reimbursement of special ed out of district costs. 
Um, so you can see the number drops from a million, 1.06 million last year, last fiscal year, this fiscal year, to 860,000. That's a $202,000 dollars reduction. So that's just one, you know, one event that has occurred uh, that I think it, that, that is part of this $185,000 that you know we, we may be looking for to not restructure the middle school. Uh, what we did last year was pass an imbalance budget. Uh, that's the other thing the committee can consider. Um, whether, you know, obviously there's a lot of considerations that we go into that, but that's the other possibility. I prefer to see a balanced budget, but last year we didn't do that. So, could have an imbalanced budget in the amount of the circuit breaker cut, for example. It's something we could do. Whether it gets what happens next, then, you know, we, we don't directly control. Yes, G. Um, <clears throat> you're absolutely right. We did it last year. It's within our purview to do again. Um, but I think the circumstances are wildly different this year. Last year, um, we instructed the superintendent in early November to present a balanced and sustainable budget to this committee because just weeks earlier, the town had voted resoundingly against an override. <coughs> and so he did that, and his team did that. And when the community and this committee um, saw what that looked like, there was obviously deep concern and a lot of engagement and a lot of demand for a second attempt at an override. And it was only in the December-January time frame that it became clear that we were on that path again. So I feel like to, to cut a major program a year ago in an environment where if we're going to go for another override and it might pass and we'd have to rebuild an entire program doesn't make any sense at all. But we're not in that circumstance this year. We have assurances that our select board is going to put an override on the ballot and these positions would be uh, restored in the event that it's passed. So the circumstances are incredibly different. Another concern I have with voting an unbalanced budget, a very serious concern I have, is last year when we were in that position, the town manager, the select board, the finance committee, and town meeting, and uh, I, if I didn't say the town manager, definitely him, worked together so powerfully to protect the schools. And we came together and they sacrificed so that we could protect those teacher cuts for one year so we could try again for a smaller amount that would last longer. Um, to go back to the, and we assured them, as Mr. Robinson said, this is just for one year. So we have time to go back to the voters with a smaller amount that will last a, a shorter time, but that will protect these positions. If we now go to that same group of people and say, we want you to do it again, I think you really run the risk of destroying some of some of the trust and collaboration that defines how well our com our government has worked together in this town, and that's worth protecting. Paul, <coughs> Paula Perry, a member of FinCom, speaking on just my individual behalf. I would reiterate the points you just made for school committee to not vote a balanced budget, I feel would be completely disingenuous and go against every relationship we've developed, been developing in the last few years. I'd be sorely disappointed. And understand all it is is kicking the can down the road as are most of these straws that we're grasping at. Because we are grasping at straws, and I understand why we are, because we're all desperate. <coughs> We're all feeling it. We're all feeling the disappointment. We're all feeling the um, impact to the town and the community. Um, and, and I would just say, in terms of ideas, I always put tremendous emphasis on the people who are working with our kids every day. And collaboratively, these are the cuts that were decided upon knowing that it was all going to hurt. So, you know, even the, the um, the, uh, the per pupil budget, the um, building, building budgets. budgets. Building budgets, thank you. Um, it sounds like an easy place to cut, but that's affecting teachers coming in every day. I would be very discouraged as a teacher every day coming in, in and saying, What? I can't make copies? What? I can't, uh, my, you know, smart board's not working. I know in my job, I would, that would, completely make me feel unsupported and have the ramifications you'd expect in terms of teaching our children. So I sure would hope for a balanced but balanced but vote though tonight. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Webb. Yeah, I just want to add that that 
you know, last year, uh, as Jean uh, Zborowski highlighted, there was a sacrifice, and and in the end, the um, well, I think the municipal side offered to help if we needed it. Um, we made the sacrifices here, and it did it did cost us because we weren't able to execute with our students in the way that we should have around whether it was substitutes being available as quickly or when we needed them, or the building-based budgets. Um, so. You know, we had to go back, and that sacrifice was again felt here. Um, so, you know, there's it was a no win. We 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 basically left the table last year thinking that we would ask the FinCom for free cash, and you know we were hopeful that they would say, <coughs> "Yes, here you go. Here's the check out of free cash. You guys will be okay for this year. Don't come back again. But here's the check." They did, they did not say that. There was $100,000 that had been talked about um, and there, there had been confusion about and then we got the 100,000 but all the, the rest, the 380 whatever it was, we had to find. Now, they also have supported us with the science uh, curriculum, the, the 150,000. So those were the, the two things that the community, the FinCom was able to help us with. But the rest of the sacrifice ended up also being, bo being born by the rest of the teachers or all of the teachers and students in the district to, to basically retain that program through this year. So. Mr. Robin. <laughs> I think those are all really good points. Um, thank you all for the comments. The, uh, for me, there is a decision that this group has control over tonight, which is what goes in the FY19 budget. The six of us decide what that's going to be tonight. We don't decide what voters are going to do in the voting booth on April 3rd. We, we don't know. Um, we can make recommendations to our select board. They have their own process and decisions to make. Um, but after tonight, you know, what we request, and, and I don't know if we'll conclude the discussion about or override request tonight or not, but there's a high level of uncertainty in my mind around what we put in that request. Um, we have 19,000 some voters, Barry, 18, 19,000. It's a pretty big number. A certain percent of them will vote. Um, we don't know how they're going to vote. We don't know what information they're going to see or hear. The only thing I know for sure that 100% of the voters who vote will see, presumably, is a number. And I don't know how they're going to react to that. So whatever we recommend for that, I think, is highly uncertain. To me, then, the decision tonight is, what do I, in my role as one of these six people, what do each of us have in our voice and our vote, within our capability and control to change in the FY19 budget? For me, I look at the cuts to the middle school not as Ms. Borowski, as I understood Ms. Borowski to say earlier, as a proportional, forgive me, Tina, if I'm misquoting, sure, sure. I thought I heard you say that we've made cuts to the elementary school, absolutely true. We've made cuts to the high school, absolutely true. And now this would be a cut to the middle school. But I view this as a cut that is different, not only in degree, yeah. but in kind. When we change, when we reduce an FTE in elementary schools, we, we've done that before. We know class sizes can go up depending on enrollment. And, and we can look at you know, how that can impact student learning. When we cut at the high school, that can affect access to student courses. I think we, we had a nice um, public comment that talked about some of the effects at the high school in one of our earlier meetings. Those are well known to the community's parents and students. Also negative, but again, incremental, and there's precedent for those cuts. And there are no cuts to the high school in this year's budget. When I look at the middle school cuts, that is a different kind of animal. That is removing the uh, access not only to foreign language, it's removing 50% or you know, roughly half of the ELA instruction time for some students. And it's limiting options for us to provide pull-out and support services for the students that need them. It's unprecedented in 30 years. We've never done it. Our middle schools really shine in, in statewide assessments that we showed, as I said earlier, an up, uptick in students who are proficient or advanced steadily from fifth grade through sixth grade and seventh grade. And then in high school, we, we have 95 plus percent proficient or advanced on state testing last year. So the middle school is working for the kids. There's, there's something about this model that I think is working. People may have different opinions, causation, correlation, whatever. but. Um, 
if I'm going to advocate for an unpredictable impact on students, I don't want it to be in that area. And the only other two buckets that I can see that are big enough to really move on a balanced budget are the building-based budgets, 10%, 668,000 out of 682,000. There's already a $200,000 hold back for part of the year. We would have to secure those funds for that stuff from somewhere else um, during the school year or in an override request, in my view. Um, and then the other piece of it is, is athletics. And I know that's not something everyone will agree with. It will have an impact on students. And I, I know there's enormous value to athletics uh, in our in extracurriculars in our community. But if I have to choose one thing that I have to change tonight in FY19, I have to make some hard choices, and that's that's where I'm leaning right now. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Karen Calafatis. I have a fifth grader at Birch Meadow who will be going to Coolidge next year. And we moved here when she was in first grade. We did so specifically for the public schools. Um, both my husband and I grew up in public schools. He works for public schools. My mother was a public school administrator in Fairfax County, Virginia. Um, and we value the community and the schools here. Um, to your last point, many of us in the community are questioning why um, why the foreign language program and and the history of these very difficult decisions that you've been faced with year after year and why um, athletics aren't in fact something that we're looking more closely at or um, other extracurricular activities. Um, can someone provide some sort of historical context for um, why it is in fact the foreign language program, which I think we can all agree would be a huge loss um, for our entire district and our children. Um, and I'm not discounting athletics because despite my own career in the performance arts, I completely value, to your point earlier, the wrestling team and the, and the value of athletics and extracurriculars. Um, but can someone please provide some historical context on that? So, uh, every year the uh, superintendent uh, will give us uh, his recommended budget uh, based on a lot of collaboration with uh, central office staff, principals, uh, teachers, and uh, bring that to the school committee. And uh, so that's the budget we're looking at tonight. Uh, and whether whatever we vote tonight will be able, will, will be to either affirm that or make changes to it uh, based on our discussions. And then it becomes the school committee budget which gets presented to the to the FinCom and ultimately town meeting. So this this was, uh, you know, I think someone said it earlier. Uh, the, uh, you know, we're 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 relying on the expert advice from the people who are with the the children every day, uh, and you know this was the uh, budget we we received as a result of that. So. Uh, we would then whatever we decide could be that or not be that. Yeah. I don't know. Does that answer your? Did you? Want oh no. no. Oh. Uh, athletics uh, has a. We've raised the athletic fee last year. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think <coughs> probably, I can't know exactly, like three years before that. So it's, uh, it is uh, paying for a lot of it. Uh, it's the, the portion you see in the budget for athletics is uh, coaches' salaries and not all the other things that go with athletics. And it, it, it does become a discussion. And, we raise fees. People have to pay to, to participate. Okay. Yes. So I've been, well, while I've been on the committee, I believe we 
cut back on gymnastics, or at one time we got rid of gymnastics. <coughs> um, we've had the hockey parents. I don't know exactly what we were doing at that time, but we had a school committee full of, of hockey parents. And I think in the end, many of those times what we did was we begrudgingly raised the fees again. We raised the fee, we raised the family cap. We've talked about that a lot already this year. I just want to, I'm going to come back to athletics for a minute, but I want to emphasize that in regard to the middle school, the issue is that we're, we're looking at, it's a middle school, not a junior high, and a period is being reduced. And so the, you, we were not going to eliminate science or math or social studies or English. Um, so uh, these were, you know, this, that was how the middle school administrators and teaching team um, really looked at what can we do to, for our share of the cut. I understand, and I can't even believe that I am arguing for athletics because I believe I lost an election in 2010 to the cross country coach, Mr. Hal Croft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was devastating right. to me, track, when I lost that election. I, I, it, was, it was horrifying um, to me. And at that time, the athletic parents were not in my corner. They were against me. Um, so this is an interesting spot. So I think the thing you have to remember about a high school in athletics is if we, and we don't know, as Ms. Borowski highlighted, if we're going to make that decision tonight, we have no idea what that's going to do. But we've got students in this high school that are in the middle of athletic careers. Or maybe they're going to actually start something junior or senior year. This is important for them as they go to college. What kind of a student are you? You're, you, you're, are you are your, how are your academics, extracurricular, your volunteer? This is a portfolio. We're not just, we are not just building a student who can do academics. That's okay, am I boring you? <laughs> okay, so there's a lot that goes into this. That social emotional support that makes a well-rounded student. I think the, the point tonight it is something that we discuss. We tend to not make cuts because instead we raise the fees to support the programs. We did make a cut this year. It is one of the cuts. And for parents who don't have kids in high school athletics who are not impacted, I know many of them have been calling Chuck um, because it does impact those students' participation. There are non-league games that they can't participate in or meets or competitions that they will not be able to participate in and that's disappointing to them and it, it, it impacts you know, their, what they get out of that sport. So we are cutting that. We've heard not as loudly as we've heard from people in this room that that's something that they're not happy about as well. I think the biggest factor is we really have no <coughs> idea how that would play out. This is a, very much along the same vein. Um, I, I, I do want to make it abundantly clear that the budget proposal the superintendent has given us includes cuts to the athletic budget. So there are cuts to the athletic budget that are on the table that I, I um, in drama as well. So I, I want to make that clear. And the way I believe, and I'll certainly defer to administration if I get any of these details wrong, the way they approached it was we'll cut across the board. So every, basically yeah. every team <laughs> will play a few fewer games. So that's the current approach. Um, the concern about taking a like 33 percent cut to that line item without understanding the impact to just share some of my fears about it not knowing what the impact would be to kids my guess is a cut like that means entire <coughs> sports are gone in yes. September and what do you say to the kid who's a junior who's lined up to be a captain who's applying to colleges that this could impact kids scholarships this could impact kids leadership this could this could really impact students in a way that scares me. I just don't understand the impact because I don't, we don't, we haven't discussed what it means. It's just a number. And I, I suspect if we saw what the number meant, um, we'd be very concerned. Yes, sir. Uh, Michael DiGiorgio, Curtis Street. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I think I'd like to uh, commend Mr. Boyvin's uh, um, efforts and, and recommendation. Um, you know, I feel you're actually upholding your responsibility as a member of this committee, member of trying to find ways to 
really satisfy everybody's demands. Um, I'd also like to say I'm a wholehearted supporter of an override. Excuse me. Wholehearted supporter of the override. Um, and also, uh, I'm not a cynical person by nature. And it hurts me to my core to actually say this, but I implore the school committee to vote for a balanced budget as recommended because the town needs to respond and unfortunately pain is probably the best motivator to get a response. Um, I, I, again, I wish I had another answer. I wish I was, wish I could provide it, but, um, and I'm not sure if it needs to be a majority vote or a unanimous vote on the budget, okay, five out of four. Well, I implore four of you, at least, to pass the budget as recommended and not to kick the can down the road for somebody else's problem to solve, um, and, but put the responsibility back into the town, excuse me, the town residents, as it's our responsibility to maintain this town. It's, it's not your responsibility to, to solve all these problems and come up with magic solutions. Um, no, thank you. Hello, Tano D, 526 West Street. I actually wanted, I agree with the previous speaker, but I wanted to go back to the question before that, um, because the recommendation uh, for the athletics budget was to bring it back to fiscal year 2016. And if we're looking at the budget of 2019, that's only three years. So could somebody explain to me why that budget is, why that's also a 33% increase, or amount of the athletics budget, why it has increased so much over these past three years? Yeah, I think so. It was, um, I think as Ms. Borowski tried to highlight, in that particular year, if you look at the budget book page 48, figure 32, it shows an offset um, from the revolving account. And that's the money that's collected in the fees. We collect the fees, and Ms. Dowd, they keep track of the fees. They can only be used to support the athletic budget if they were collected for an athletic fee or a gate fee. Yeah. And in that year, we used 380,000, which was 50,000 in the previous year higher, 50,000 higher, and 80,000 higher than the subsequent year. So we basically used the revolving account to avoid probably in that year raising fees. And I, I don't know what years we raised the fees, but my guess is we then realized in the next year, if we continue to take that much money out of the revolving account, we would drive it down to zero. And so probably we, um, we that subsequently re reduced the amount of offset and then we raised the fee so that we could support the programs. I'm not recalling that in this time period we have actually, we haven't eliminated um, athletics, we raised the fees. So was the 2016 athletic budget significantly lower than the 2015 and 2014 budget? Yes, it was 405,000 because we used such a uh, significant offset. So Mr. Bobbin was suggesting we go back to that level. It's 200,000 different from, from what we're proposing. And that's not because of the fees happen to be larger that, se that year, it's just the amount that we took out of the revolving no. account. Yeah, we, okay. we were given re uh, guidance to, to use that amount out of okay. the revolving account at Thank that you. Time. That helps understand why that particular year is not a good year to go back to. Well, yeah. and the, there's another factor that's been in play at least this year and maybe last year is that the fees, we, we are seeing a higher percentage of students that qualify for free and reduced lunch and that's one of the ways, areas in which students are, uh, or families are provided with um, a proportionality on the fee. And so um, this, and we'll know at the end of this year sort of what that impact is, but what that means is more students are qualifying for reduce, reductions of the fees. Um, so that's sort of another, another danger of, you know, f further reducing this budget. Um, it it may, may mean that we're, again, we don't know what we would be cutting, but we would be cutting, we would be cutting the rug out from under kids. Thank you. No, my main question was just that 2016 was not a reflective yeah. year. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair. Carl, I have Yes, Carl. Do you mind letting you Can I just make a quick point of yes. clarification? For anybody at home um, who wanted to look at the numbers for that question, it's page 48 of the budget book, figure 32. Um, if you want to look, it's got the last several years I thought of budget. If you want to look at the numbers. Thank you. Mr. Well. Hi, thank you. Carl Weld. Um, 
just got a question about encumbered funds and it, um, my apologies if this has been addressed before but um, looking at a document that says expended funds as of 30 June 17 so that would be the end of last budget and it said actual uh, actuals 39.5 roughly give or take with the next column over says encumbered as of that same date roughly 900,000 and in your budget document the actuals that you're indicating spent for FY 17 is 39.5 what's the what's going on with that encumbered 900,000 is that how long does that no wait to be spent those, Gail, did you so those would be funds that we have purchase orders <coughs> as of the end of the year. So as so it, it it has been encumbered, and then typically they would get spent down within the next couple of months. So a lot of it is we do have some tuition that we can prepay three months. Okay. So we would encumber those funds as of the end of the year. The and fiscal year or the calendar the invoices. year? Fiscal. fiscal. So as of the end of June, those funds are encumbered. And then we would pay those invoices in the next two to three months. Any funding that does not get paid out on those goes back to free cash. Shouldn't that be reflected in your actuals now, though? Typically, um, because they're part of last year's funding, it's... we. It depends how you typically run the reports. Those that those do count against last year's funding. If we do not spend it, if we close the purchase order and do not spend it, that money goes back into free cash. We're not allowed to respend it in the current year if not spent. Okay. So I could go so back and look at how we run the reports for the charts. Historically, we've done it based upon actual cash out the door, not encumbered funds. Okay. So when this budget was prepared none of that money had been spent yet had been paid yet uh, some of it may have been but again it would be it wouldn't get counted towards the current year budget it would be in last year's budget okay um, and one other question if I may um, why are there what I think could be considered capital expenses in an operating budget computers servers hardware it's the equivalent of asking the chief to lay off a couple of police officers to purchase a new patrol car I mean I don't understand why that's in the operating budget I can answer if you want yeah so according to fin finance committee policy um, you cannot have capital items that have a shelf life less than 10 years and they need to cost a certain amount of funding so technology would not fit in that category our technology I don't think we would want the last 10 years. Sometimes it does, but uh, that's, not, that's not the intent of it. So that would be an operating expense, not a uh, capital expense. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Did someone else have it? Did you? Yes, Nick. So yeah, I'll um, make a go back to the, now uh, before I make a motion. Um, I want to go back to the previous couple questions. Um, talk about athletics for a moment. I also want to look. I mean, I think it was Gene you brought up figure 32. I also want to look at figure 33. I'm very clear about this. That's the participation rate in our high school athletic program, right? That's just high school. We have other athletic programs. But if you, if you do the math, you know, up to two-thirds of our students are participating in athletics, right? If, if 1,229 students in 16, 17, now, you know, that assumes that no one who plays one sport doesn't play another. That's probably not a not true but people playing multiple sports but uh, in, in any case it's, it's a very high percentage of our students um, athletics and, and Miss Borowski if I could go back to a point I remember from our deliberation last year I re I, and, and Jean I think it was you talking about a, a particular student who really was drawn into higher academic performance as a result in, in, in the storyteller's experience, as I remember from last year, was when, because of his commitment to athletics. And that, that there is this phenomenon where, where students who are really engaged in athletics and, and are very motivated by that can also become kind of cross-motivated in academics and can excel even more academically. So I don't want to lose sight of the fact that, the, that there is 
very real academic as well as human development that benefit to academics, uh, to athletics as well as academics, and the two are not mutually exclusive or disconnected. And second, that we have a very high rate of participation in athletics. W what I want to get at with the proposal that I'd like to make, it doesn't, you know, for a balanced budget, the question in my mind is what do we put at risk after tonight? What are we going to put at risk? There are no good answers here. These are all going to hurt somebody, all of these guys. Um, I talked earlier at the beginning of this tonight about the, what I view as the impact of the middle school restructuring. That's 485,000 and, and a little more. You know, I'm wondering if, if we want to make substantial cuts to building based budgets in athletics, plus the business assistant, the data coach, kindergarten, and perhaps a small thousand dollar cut to regular day, and I'll lay these out in a minute. Uh, to put what I think are very real student needs at risk, but different student needs. And so my view is that the needs of the students in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade for academics come first. That's my view. And that's why I'm going to propose some cuts and changes to these cuts in a minute, and the committee can do what they think is best. Thank you. Yes. Again, I know we all um, have the same goal, the same outcome that we desire. Um, so I guess one of my uh, questions, though, is that if the override were to pass, we'll be able to maintain our teachers. If it doesn't pass, we're going to be back here next year, and we're going to be facing the same dilemma again. So one of my concerns is about the sustainability of doing it this this year, because it feels a little like a Band-Aid to me, and I don't know then what we do next year. We have the discussion for the third time, kind of a Groundhog Day um, phenomenon. So I worry about that sustainability. Thank you. Is that going to make a motion? Did you say you were going to make a motion? Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Do you want us to make other motions, or do you want to go to this first? Yeah. So I'd like to um, propose an amendment to the balanced budget, to a different balanced budget the committee consider the following package of proposed changes to the superintendent's recommended balance budget. One, cut to athletic, just let me make sure I'm correct on this. Athletics, extracurriculars, or district-wide cost center? Yes. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I'm proposing a $200,000 cut to the district-wide cost center to be distributed primarily among athletics and extracurriculars. A $100,000 cut, just like we did last year, to the building-based budgets. I believe those reside in regular day. A $70,000 cut to the administrative cost center by removing the business assistant. A $66,000 cut to the administrative cost center. Correct me, is that regular day or? That is regular day, and just to point out, we are not going to be able to sustain that position on the grant next year. So it would be a cut, we would cut to the, the position. FTE. The position regular would have day. to be cut. So a $66,000 cut to regular day cost center for the data coach position being the removed. Coach. A $49,000 cut to kindergarten regular day. What's the, yeah, the tu $49? It's the tuition. By made up by, oh, I'm sorry, by raising. That's fees. increasing the offset by 49000 which was in the proposal that we had made. No, I think this 49, is an additional 49000 Is that legally permitted or is that not legally permitted? The, the full-time teacher that we are adding, half of that teacher would be attributable to full-day kindergarten, so half of the salary could be taken against the offset. So is that half of 49 That it would be, the 49 we proposed is half teacher, half Paris. So you can't go any lower than 49 No. Right. Okay. Legally. And then the remaining. So what? Wait. What was the forty-nine next? Well, I'm not. That's what I'm trying okay. to understand. I was going to propose forty-nine thousand to kindergarten, which is the remaining half. But I don't think you can do that legally, correct? Correct. All right. So forty-nine thousand. The forty-nine thousand that we had up here is as far as you can go. You cannot go anymore without raising fees or limiting access. You could also limit access. No, to you can't. We have put in the budget. That's if, the half-day kindergarten. That's all we can do. Okay. So we can't cut that anymore. All right. Thank you for the clarification. And the remaining forty-nine thousand eight hundred eighty cut to regular day. 800. And that, in addition, it, to balance that, so that just freed up 
$485,880. And with that money, I propose that we retain the seven FTE middle school teachers and retain the current schedule uh, foreign language programs and uh, all additional student services that that schedule permits. We need five so, bucks, Chad. Uh, the huh? do we need five bucks or no? Okay. We're, we're oh, so, no, five bucks. Is, no. so of of all the recommended cuts, you're restoring the middle school. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. So. Mr. Singleton, I, I'll reread it and we'll make sure we're, we've got it. I'll reread the motion. Did you get get it all? Yeah. Okay. Well, so I think I, I but Sorry. I don't know if I can read. No. To pro the proposed the amendment budget. to balance the budget will be to cut the district wide cost center primarily in athletics and extra, extracurricular by 200000 to cut the building based budgets by 100000 to cut the proposed school business assistant, which is a minus 70,000, to eliminate the data coach from regular day, which is a minus 66,000, and then to further cut regular day by 49,880, and then to add back in and retain the seven FTEs at the middle school and all the programs associated with the cuts to the middle school model at, for an add back of 485,880. And there was already a second. A second, yeah. Any discussion? Question. Yes, Jean. <clears throat> so that it, that last minute addition of the 49K is somewhere in the neighborhood of half of a teacher from regular day? It is. Um, where are you proposing we cut that half of a teacher? <laughs> elementary, high school, somewhere else in the middle school? Boys. Elementary. We, I mean, typically we have to give direction and cost on level, so it would be whatever would be recommended by the administration. So that's another one where we don't know the student impact. That's correct. Yes, Ms. Dr. Jackson. I, um, like one of our previous speakers, I forget your name in the blue shirt. Um, I hate to say what I'm about to say. Um, with these cuts, I'm thinking about the sustainability and the damage as well. And with the cut of the middle school foreign language, although it is no um, reassurance to me, and I did hear what the teacher said about harder on the freshman teachers, but there is language waiting for these kids when they get to high school. They're not going to be without it forever. That doesn't make me feel any better to say that. Um, but some of these other cuts, um, more regular day cuts, the data coach at a time when we really need our teachers to have the information to support our um, highly challenged students and, and regular day are um, Building budgets that are already challenged, our business assistant, which we've already seen, I think, the need for. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't need the teachers. I think we do. But that's weighing on me, too, that we have a great language program that can be waiting for our kids in freshman year in high school. Um, it doesn't take the place of learning earlier. I think our kids ought to learn language in elementary school, frankly. But faced with what we have now and my desire to find a long-term solution, I think that we're shooting ourselves in the foot to put a Band-Aid on this um, hemorrhaging wound right now. Thank you. I guess, uh, as I would, as I said earlier, uh, I thank you for, for this proposal. Uh, my biggest concern with it is the, and I was one of the ones that led the charge to do this, something very similar to this last year, uh, and uh, as as it being a one-time thing uh, with the uh, prospect of passing an override. 
I don't I, we can't keep doing this we have to, to to make a decision and and let the community know this is serious stuff and and uh, you know we can't keep moving the dollars around uh, and uh, with you know uh, just year after year we just can't pit every program against program every year so. yes Did you? so I agree that this is far from a sustainable path that we're on if, if our if you know, our revenues grow at even at three and a half percent um, it's not our area of expertise but our, our school, our current schools are growing at you know, 4.9 to 5.2 percent in the last five years consistently, even with 3.4 million dollars being taken out. Uh, we, do, we do, I believe, need an override. The question is getting, getting a number that you know, all of the stakeholders feel is the right number, and voters will decide you know, if the selectmen choose to put that on the ballot. Voters will decide whether they want to pay higher taxes to support the proposal. I would support replenishing the building-based budget, um, replenishing athletics, extracurriculars with, with that type of proposal. We haven't really gone there in detail tonight. What I'm proposing now is a return to FY16 level for athletics. It's not no funding for athletics, it's the FY16 level. I'm proposing a cut in the building budgets that we made last year. And granted, it was viewed as unsustainable, but we did do it and also cutting some additional positions and, um, and a portion of the largest cost center. I think that's the right path for this committee for tonight. I do not think it is the right path for our town, our committee, our schools beyond tonight. It's a question of what you put at risk on April 3rd and what you decide tonight. Thank you. Any other discussion? I just wanted to yes. make one point, if I could. That um, I also just wanted to say that when I vote tonight, it will not be to intentionally inflict pain on the community to make a point. Um, that is not, I think, what anybody's goal here or intent here is. It's really weighing and balancing what we think causes the least harm. And we may have different opinions about that, but nobody's here, I think, to do anything but what we really think is at least harm to the kids. Thanks. Anyone else? All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Mm -hmm. Do you have to vote? Yep. Um, one in favor, five against. The motion doesn't carry. Is there another motion? Um, I can make it. Yeah. Just um, like to make a motion, I don't know if Dr. Doherty, oh, is it up there? 42723025. To pass a budget um, of 42723025 dollars. Um, and that would, as shown on the slide, reflect the changes we talked about tonight, which is to add, instead of four elementary teachers cut, there's three, um, additional increase in the offset, and a adjustment in the curricular, extracurricular stipends down $10,000. Is there a second? Mr. Boab? Can I ask a question? Is that the, f it's the full Superintendent's balanced budget as amended, correct? That's the motion yes. for that amount. Thank you. Any other questions? All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? 5-1. Thank you. Vote on that. Vote was four, uh, five in favor, one opposed. And we'll take a uh, like a ten minute recess before we go into the other budget override. Override. The right, reconstruction override budget. Yeah. So we will be voting on that this evening.
in the room. <laughs> to call the meeting back to order, uh, thank you uh, for everyone on the committee and in the community uh, participation uh, on the um, the other budget now uh, I'd like to start the conversation on the uh, reconstruction budget so is, did you want to kick things off um, so Dr. Doherty we have um, on the slide the basically this is in the order of um, oh actually is it different sorry Mm. All right. no, we, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't. Are you asking me a question? I can't hear you. I, sorry, I thought I would, we were looking at the. Um, what you were looking at is now the adjusted list based on the vote we did. So instead of four elementary teachers, it's now three elementary teachers. Right. And that amount, uh, the difference is captured below. Right, and I, I just want to make it clear that this is not a prioritized list. I know there's a, a document that just lists these sort of from. Uh, was being highest to lowest or lowest to highest. We were going to put that in ascending order at some point, right? From lowest expense to highest. We yes, just, we're, we, yeah, um, yeah. We just want to make sure that yes, people understand that. Order. Yeah, this is not a priority ordered list. Um, I guess I, I would just I'll kick this off and to say that we've already had I think two nights of discussion on this reconstruction uh, plan and. I know that actually on the handout we have in front of us, um, there was some sort of, uh, I know Mr. Bobbin had suggested that we um, identify some of the positions we'll restore or retain, and I know that we, we have done that, at least on this handout. Um, so I think that that was an important clarification. I think one of the most important things for me is that I think these are all things that over the course of um, I guess if you look back at least five years or even longer, many of these things are things that we've been talking about for a long time in terms of learning and teaching and instructional leadership and support. And I know, as I said, over the last few nights, uh, we've spent time listening to um, principals and teachers talk about what some of these things mean to them. Um, so from my perspective, um, this is, you know, this is a list of the things that we need. This isn't a wish list. These are the things that we feel are critical, um, or I feel are critical, for our school district to stabilize and to move forward. Um, so again, some of these things are restoring some positions um, that were eliminated in previous budgets or, or positions that would be eliminated in this budget. Um, there's some uh, cur curriculum and instructional material that we've, we've been talking about, the curriculum coordinators. There's some really, um, there's some, some very good restructuring of positions to enable us to uh, achieve what I believe we need for district leadership that will support the teachers. Um, and the goal of providing that teacher support is to provide students with more effective instruction, support, and outcomes. And we've heard from um, Craig Martin and Carolyn Wilson, as well as the teachers and principals. Um, so I, I support the, the um, override, reconstruction slash override budget as it's presented. Thank you. It's Dr. Doxa, did you? Sorry, I thought I saw you. Uh -huh. No, I hadn't raised my hand. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Dr. Nardi, for updating the slide. Um, second, one of the points I wanted to make relates to respond two slides that people can look up if they're interested that I'm looking at now, and, and it, it's going to tie back into a question I have about the, the numbers in the teacher-student personnel section. One is slide or page 12 of the January 8, 2018 handout. And that is a detailed list of the budget reductions from FY14 to 19. And Dr. Darty and his team did a really nice job of separating out reductions that were made by FTE versus um, non-personnel um, reductions per year. Okay, so that's that's one part of this. 
it, it, I'll, I'll read the relevant information from that in a moment. And, this, and the second part is uh, response five, page five, in the response to school committee questions, which is a table. And, and what I want to do with that information is this, is, is I want to focus on the difference in those teacher positions, and I'll include the salary adjustment for two. The top, everything under the first blue bar there. Some of those positions are restoring teaching positions that we just cut moments ago, right? So these are teachers that are in positions that exist right now as, we, as I speak here in the Reading Public Schools, and we just adopted a budget at school committee that will cut these positions starting next fiscal year at the end, end of the summer. So let me identify what I think those positions are. So the seven FTE middle school teachers, right? So that's retain where we would, well, it's no longer retaining, it's restoring because we just voted sure. to eliminate yeah, them. You so, got a point. Yep. Um, yeah. so we're restoring seven FTE middle school teachers. So that, that, those are teachers that are currently in our middle schools. Um, the three elementary school teachers, same thing, right? Um, and then education, real ed, regular education tutor, also in the school. So those 11 FTE, those are all people that are currently in the building. Mm -hmm. The six FTE high school teachers are different. Those are teachers who are not here right now, right? Mm -hmm. So as I look back over past years and I look at the January 8th handout, it's my understanding that 3.8 FTE high school was cut in FY18, 2.2 FTE FY in FY17, so that gets you to your 6.0 FTE. So the point I want to make is, in all this is this, is that if you look to page five of the handout of the response to school committee question, in FY19, there was a 5.2% required increase in required to maintain level service. So to not let the middle school teachers go, the elementary school teachers go, the regular education tutor, right, to keep all our personnel intact, and to keep all our funding intact outside of those personnel, 5.2% more needed in FY19 than FY18. Okay. The funds available for school committee, 3.2% right, from for funding. So we have a gap of 2%. I want to focus in on that. That 2% gap doesn't sound like a lot to someone. Two is a small number. It's just a little bigger than one, right? Um, when you're building on a 40 to $45 million base, it's a big number. 1% could be upwards of 400,000. 2% can be a ballpark of $800,000, right? So if, if we go forward, my concern in, in, as we look at adding positions to this request that are not already in our school system is understanding the impact of those additions on the incre future increases to maintain those positions. Right, we, we want to design a request that's going to allow for sustainability. And I want to point out that since FY14, we've been making cuts. And so every year, FY14, we make cuts. FY15, we need 5.1% more money after the cut to maintain level service. We don't get it, we make more cuts. Then we need 4.8% in FY16. We make more cuts. We need 4.8% again in FY17. We make more cuts. 4.9% needed in FY19. We make more cuts, we just did half hour ago. We need 5.2% for level service. So we're taking me all out people out of the system, run rate is going up at about 5%. If we add positions we have that have never been all together in that school system, we need to account for the cost of those positions year over year over year over year and make sure that we're not biting off more that we can chew, that we're we're designing this request in a way, and, and, and all of these things have educational benefit. I want to be very clear on that. I'm not zeroing in on anything or, or anything else or trying to prioritize anything. I'm just pointing out that in my mind, there's a difference between a collection of FTEs we've had where we know what the increase is going to be, say 5.2%, and adding FTEs to a school system where I don't know that we know what that increase is going to be. Is it 5.3? Is it 5.5? Is it 6? I don't know. I don't know. So. That's a consideration for the committee. In my mind, there's, there's retaining existing FTE positions that we just cut half an hour ago is in, you know, not only extremely important, in my view, essential, but I would also make sure we look very carefully at anything we add beyond that to make sure that it's sustainable for a period of time that this community finds acceptable. I haven't yet heard anyone propose an annual overrun. I've not heard that. I don't think it's not my area, Barry. That's your area. We want. We've talked at other meetings 
vary about longer periods of time. 14 years is too long. Uh, I agree with that, but you know, we've talked publicly, um, you know, at other meetings I've heard people talk about a three year or, or more period of time, but you know, I think if we, if we want to make a, we also want to make sure that the request we're making is sufficiently, that there's a sufficiently certain tie to student learning and benefit that we're not asking for things that are speculative either, and I'm not passing judgment on anything in this list other than to say, I would prioritize, first of all, for me, the middle school teachers, the elementary school teachers, um, some funds for the, the tutor, um, and I think beyond that adding, you know, what we can to classroom teachers in the classroom environment like the 6FD high school teachers, I, I'm supportive of that provided that we can account for at least three years of increased uh, cost of the positions we add. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so. So I, I agree that sustainability is really important and I think it's been very useful how you've pointed out these increases and that they're not. Um, at this rate, we're, this is probably not sustainable over time. I completely understand that. Um, I'm going to say something that's going to sound a bit counterintuitive, I think. Uh, when I look at the um, assistant principal positions, um, and this on a, a handout we have, they're called assistant principals at elementary schools. I'm glad that on the slide here, it says as elementary assistant principals slash special ed team chairs. I would actually almost reverse that in my mind and put the special ed team chair title <coughs> first. I feel that if we do this correctly, and if we really get special ed team chairs into the schools and we can help slow that growth rate of special ed, first of all, I think it's best for the kids because, uh, for obvious reasons, and secondly, I think it's good for the budget. So my hope is if that we get the correct um, kinds of structures and supports here, that it will help stem that unsustainable rate of growth. So. In special education. In Dr. special education. Dr. Doherty, I know you yeah. explained this. I just can't. Was, is that position represented or is that non-represented? Non-represented. Okay. Anyone else? Thank God. Yes. Jeffrey Carr, Ridge Road. Uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Bowen's point about sustainability. I did want to clarify something I think I understand from the, the high school that, in fact, some of those teachers are actually here and they're working at point eight or point six of a job that in those cuts, um, you know, somebody said, look, I want to stay in the Reading School Department. I'll take it for a year, oh, maybe two years. But, you know, these are people who are actually, are actually still in the district. And in fact, their benefits are already being covered to some extent, at least. So, you know, okay. <laughs> Great point. Thank you. FTEs are not necessarily bodies. It's just full-time equivalent. So it's number of hours that would be times their, their pay rate. So, thank yes, you, Jeff. Jane. That's right. I think um, my colleagues have brought up a really good point about sustainability and how that isn't built in here. However, I think that needs to be a discussion with our Board of Selectmen because there would be no way for us to build in a sustainability function here until we knew what time frame they were looking for. And that really, to me, falls into their sandbox, not ours. So I think it's a good point, but I think that's got to be an ongoing conversation with um, our colleagues. Also a good point. <coughs> yes, Paul. Sorry. I did just want to make a couple points. Um, really with doing no ride, you're really upping the base. Mm -hmm. So your rate of growth isn't going to be any different, really, mm -hmm. based on whether you make it this many FTEs or this many. The rate of growth will remain the same, unless you are really skewing expense, one-time costs versus FTEs. But since the whole school budget is so heavily weighted to FTEs, mm -hmm. you're not really affecting your, your sustainability. Um, and then in terms of sustainability, we thought we were so smart last year or you know, a year and a half ago when we developed the override number, thinking we were doing the right thing and building in sustainability. It sounded really good on paper. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It just got too big. 
and I just keep going back to what we, you know, what was done 14 years ago. When we did that override, it was really winging a prayer. It was, here's the number we need now, mm -hmm. and it was no more to build in sustainability. And here we are 14 years later. I don't know how we did it, but we did it with no sustainability designed in. It sounds really good on paper. It just gets too big. Mm -hmm. Ms. Webb. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll make a motion and then we can continue yep. the um, discussion. Um, the motion to um, accept the reconstruction plan slash override budget um, as shown and proposed at $2.436 million. Second. Second. Okay. So then I have some, we'll mm -hmm. continue discussion now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I think everything is, you know, important here. Uh, I guess the one, and I, but I, I heard what Paula just said, but I, I do believe that we could get to the point where there isn't sustainability in whatever uh, we put forward. Uh, and, you know, I just don't want to be in a position uh, 12 months or 24 months from now saying, you know, we got to get, get rid of something that, that we put in here. Uh, so I guess, can you just kind of talk a little bit more about the, Dr. Doherty, the, the curriculum coordinators? I, guess, I just, I know there are, you know, that you spoke very well and passionate about it. I guess I just get concerned that, you know, when we had to make cuts, we got rid of the, the, the tutors that we needed for Joshua Eaton, the math tutor, or uh, coaches, I'm sorry, math coach and the curriculum coach. And I know this isn't the same thing, but I just, is this, are we, I just want to make sure we're not uh, really adding a luxury item here that we just, we can't do. Uh, so. Oh, I'm going to ask you about this tomorrow. <clears throat> yep. Answer this question. So yeah, actually, um, in the packet, because we did receive an email about that, and I clarified a little bit of the difference um, between the coaches and the coordinators. Um, the coordinators are, in, uh, in this proposal, in most districts, considered administrative positions. Um, and as it says here in the handout that we have tonight, that they would be responsible for the coordination necessary. Um, or I'm, not, I'm sorry, let me back up here. That they would in practice be focusing on our K-5 elementary schools, um, but they would also make sure, making sure that we have consistency across the elementary schools, but they would also be sure that we have good vertical coherence through eighth grade um, in our curriculum. Um, but they would be responsible for coordinating and maintaining our curriculum documents. They would be providing the content expertise and feedback for staff. They'd be working very closely with our administrators and our teachers. Um, they would be able to give feedback regularly to teachers, um, be part of observations and so forth. Um, I mentioned in the look in the uh, email reply that we regularly attend regional meetings with other districts um, around our area, and often there's other assistant superintendents there. Many of the other districts, um, most of our comparable districts do have these types of positions. Um, it was somewhat telling to me just this last Friday because the state hasn't even released a draft form yet for public, uh, their new social studies framework. And there are a couple districts who mentioned that day that <coughs> their coordinators had already begun mapping. So one had already finished um, their complete K-12 continuum for social studies. Um, ready for the state to release it to see what kind of changes then they would have to be making in the district. Um, and so in times of great change like this, I think this is one of the areas that has been a disadvantage for us because so many districts do have people with this expertise. Um, we know, you know, one of, the, one of the districts that I mentioned in the email was there, the assistant superintendent was not able to attend, but five members of their curriculum team were there at this regional meeting. We know that we would never be able to have as many support positions as other districts, so we try to be very clean in what were the ones um, around special education, the support to principals, and curriculum that we think would 
um, not only provide improved student outcomes, but also provide cost savings, we think, in the long run. Um, exactly to Dr. Van Den Acker's point. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Webb. Uh, just maybe a, a brief a point of um, emphasis or clarification on that from um, Carolyn Wilson on the um, special education, the Rise Preschool, because I think there's some, again, points there where it sort of goes towards sustainability. If there's things that we can do much better and things that we're just not getting to and it's costing us either, it's either costing us real dollars or it's costing us in our ability to as effectively as we want to deliver services to students. So uh, just maybe a 30 second recap on it. So to provide more clarification, we did kind of list out an assistant director of student services with under that the responsibilities of the RISE preschool. And so that person would be managing the RISE preschool and the supervision and evaluation. But from a district-wide perspective, um, I think as I've talked about, um, typically, for instance, in the summer, I'm the only person in the student services office that works all summer. And so there are things that come up, student issues, planning that needs to get done, and not having a, an administrative team to pull upon. Um, that usually is really me. So having another person who works year-round would really help support that. We're also looking at really building the work that's being done in our in-district special education programs. There were a lot of questions throughout this process about marketing and yeah. you know where do we stand well having someone who is really overseeing those programs our enrollment in those programs um, I uh, prior to our meeting last week I met with the CPAC their families are looking for more detailed information about our program so having someone who can be centralized who can coordinate that from a K-12 um, and on to post-grad really would help us as a district to streamline that process and be able to really showcase our programs whereas now that really happens kind of we try to provide some leadership we have great teacher leaders so I don't want to discount them and our team chairs do a great job but everyone kind of has a full plate so having this be more centralized and the other piece is as you know we've gone through this process both with the Office for Civil Rights, we have our um, regular reviews <coughs> with the Mass Department of Education and having um, additional administrators who are looking at our compliance really is going to help us in that process. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to monitor more closely our compliance, our timelines, all of those required pieces um, really are going to help us on <coughs> that end um, so that we don't run into issues of non-compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it looks like Dr. Dox. Thank you. Um, having been at the seat at the CPAC table, I cannot um, support enough this um, this new restructuring of the um, Rise Preschool Director and Special Ed Assistant. I think it's a fabulous idea, a fabulous use of resources that will help us um, not only with special ed but also. Um, in terms of RISE and looking forward because RISE has both special ed students and regular ed students and that um, assistant director will have a sense of both all of the population so I really do um, support that I have a question um, that's just I'm stuck on something um, and we've talked a lot about tier one supports and how that can um, decrease the number of special ed students going forward because we're going to meet the needs of students earlier and in this um, reconstruction plan we restore the um, one of the two regular ed tutors um, which I love and I'm wondering about that second special the second regular education tutor that we had and looking at the restoration of the vacation cleaning and the athletics um, funding and extracurricular funding and wondering if there might be some compromise there to pull that 25000 out to do the second regular education tutor and find a compromise with the, um, the however much it is the um, 43,000 minus the 25. Um, 
So I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about that. So one of the things that we said uh, when we introduced this reconstruction override budget was that we did not put everything back that has been cut over the last several years. So we s strategically are putting positions that we feel moving forward are going to make us as effective as possible. Remember when we made the two cuts for the tutors, one was at the middle school and one was at the elementary. We're restoring the elementary cut. <coughs> middle school cut, there was, there's been a tutor at the middle school at Coolidge for mm -hmm. probably 25 years. Um, Parker has not, did not have a similar position. So mm -hmm. we did not restore that position. But the elementary is being restored in this model. Thank you. Ms. Webb? Um, yeah, I just, a uh, clarification on, on clerical support. I know that there's actually some sort of partial FTE return to the municipal side. Is that netted out in this number or not? No, currently we split a position with the town. It is fully funded by the town. We have 40% of it. So this is to allow us to have a 1.0 FTE, but the full cost would be on the school side because currently the full cost is on the town side so this would allow the town to have 1.0 and for the schools to have 1.0 and, and was that something that um, the municipal I don't know if you've had conversations with Bob that they were um, looking forward to or is he then cutting I, I just don't know what I'm just sort of I know it's our budget but I it's a uh, no, they're not cutting. They're not. They're not cutting that. Oh, no. so. Barry, can you use? The <laughs> Barry Berman, I, I believe in in uh, the um, restorative budget that the town manager put together. There is a half time position for an HR person I'm not sure if that's supposedly split or not but it's there's also a piece in the municipal budget I'm not sure how it's been discussed if it's or maybe that's just for the town it's budget. just for the it's municipal budget. Right. okay but it, yeah so I just want to make sure we obviously account for that piece going back on the municipal side that's all so thank you Sherry okay so um, I just wanted to go back to curriculum coordinators I understand that that can be a little esoteric um, for people, but for me, when I look at um, our five neighborhood elementary schools and their scores, and I see how much they fluctuate year to year, grade to grade, school to school, that to me concerns me a lot. Um, it concerns me even for the middle school teachers because they're getting kids with all, you know, it's a lot easier if you kind of know what all the fifth graders coming into your school actually studied and focused on. So I think that those curriculum coordinator positions will really help. I mean, we've invested a lot in this community in neighborhood schools, and we, I feel, don't have the enough support in them, at least is the, the test scores indicate to me with those fluctuations that we really do need some help. Um, getting consistency across those schools. So. Mr. Bob. <coughs> the um, handout from the 20th, slide 8, page 8, it, it had the same chart before the modification we talked about tonight, and I'm wondering, that chart had a column for benefits, which were estimated at 25% of cost, and I'd like to know what happened to that chart and how we've decided to deal with cost of benefits and accommodated costs. So we have been working closely with the town manager uh, on the whole calculation of the benefits. It is an accommodated cost. The reason why we don't have it up here right now is because we're working out a better way to show that for both the municipal and for schools. So we want the committee just to focus on this piece and then when we get to a further point where we have a clear understanding of what that's going to look like, then we'll be more than happy to explain that piece to you. But we are working with the town manager on that. Mrs. Dowd and myself met with the town manager last week, um, and we're going to continue to have that conversation. 
And, and Mr. Robinson was part of that meeting too. <laughs> well, the, the well, that was the meeting. Oh, the yeah, that was the meeting before. Right. The, right. The so I, th I think it's important to note that um, the town manager is really, you know, basically <coughs> saying, "I want to take this. We're going to look at it in one manner," and they they're re-looking at, you know, what are they including in that? So it, that's it didn't go away. It's just right. being right. addressed. I think the important thing is we're trying to come up with a sustainable, to use your term from earlier. Yeah. But, the model we want to put forward that includes benefits and perhaps even other things needs to be sustainable. So that's why we're retooling it. Okay, that's fine for, can I sure. a couple? So one of the points that came out of the discussion last time, I think was that to the extent that we can take all of these new personnel additions, and I want to just focus on the personnel additions that are proposed, the FTEs, I guess it could be time to, our speaker's point earlier, but the, the FTE at full-time equivalent additions, time, we're buying time from people, right? There are three, three types of time we're, I see on this list. There's restoring time, restoring FTEs to the budget that we just cut in FY19. And to the extent that there's a benefit calculation for that, there's a comment, I think, in our last meeting uh, that went to the point that, look, we're already paying benefits for these people. So that shouldn't be double counted in a request. So I, so I think to the extent we come up with an approach, let's account for the fact that yeah. We, we don't have to, we shouldn't be double counting benefits for people that are currently here, okay? We know what the cost of the benefit is and we pay it. All right. Secondly, there's a set of restructure positions here. There's two of them, restructure 2.4, restructure 1.0. Those are the most unclear to me as to what the added incremental benefit cost would be there. So, I, you know, for me, I would want to know, before I would vote for a proposal, I would want to know how the town and and schools have aligned on the approach for estimating that cost. And then, of course, there are new FTEs that we're adding that are not currently part of the FY18 school year, right? And so that includes the six high school teachers and uh, I think at least one more line item up there. So for me, restoring, we maybe don't need to double count, don't want to double count benefits. Restructure, let's get the right number for what the benefit, incremental increase in benefit is, uh, if any. And for new positions, let's agree on a, an approach with uh, our colleagues on other boards about how we're going to count uh, benefits. But I need to know the all-in cost for the proposal before I can support it. Thanks. John. No, I was just going to say that you won't have that information this evening. That's part of what I was explaining earlier, that that's something we're working out with the town manager. And I, my understanding is that will be part of the discussion with the board of selectmen on January 30th. Right. So, right, the so, guidance from the town manager was to go forward with the, this portion of it and for us to be able to make our decision. Um, I, so to, to restructure or restore, I mean, benefits follows a person, not the cost of the person. <laughs> so if we're restructuring, uh, it, I, don't, I don't know that the number of in number of enrollees change, it's just the positions change. <coughs> correct, correct, Dr. Daria. So, I apologize, I did not update the slide appropriately. Right. What you should be looking at is this here. Yeah. It was this on has the, the correct verbiage, mm -hmm. so I apologize for that. For the handout that was given out this evening. Yeah. The only the only change on this one is that it still has four elementary teachers and now it will be three. So the number is going to change. But you have restore, meaning that they currently do not exist. Right. Mm -hmm. Retain, meaning they do exist right now and they're going to be cut right. in the next budget. And restructure means we're taking existing positions um, and adding to create more of these different positions but with with when you're re I understand restore that's another FTE that's going to need benefits Correct. yep uh, re, uh, retain. retain same thing because okay. is restructure that's yeah. not adding another FTE correct it, it is oh. it, what you're adding you're adding 2.4 and you're adding 1.0 to get five to get yeah, I, I, I know what it is now yeah these are, these are the FTEs that we're adding. This is all add. This is not other positions that exist. 
So, then we so just, just to strong. be clear, no, he's got it here. Are we? Vo we're not voting on the number up on the screen then. That's not. No, you are voting on that number. Or are we voting on the number in the handout because they're different? No, as I explained, this was made before you voted on the okay. elementary teacher okay. change. So it is. It is that right. It it is. What it I did is that change. number plus some unknown amount of. What I didn't change on the slide, and I apologize. Uh, the verbiage okay, that, thank that you. was the requested. The last one. We thank did you. change it on here. Okay. Right, but then the number wasn't updated for. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Yes, Ms. Burroughs. I, um, I just want to go back to that issue of benefits. I, I definitely think that the Board of Selectmen, when they meet, need to take into account all of that. But we're not the board that will be deciding the total all-in number. And where there's a plan in place for the two sides to work together to get to those numbers by the 30th, I'm confident we'll get there. Yeah, yeah. I just think we need to get the actual head count correct. Exactly. So. Well, and, and my, my proposal would just to be have some language that allows for that, because we voted for a number tonight. I just want to oh, make sure yeah. that we actually are doing we our, our for, job right, for a dollar plus, value plus and some whatever incremental added benefits may follow that number, right? That, I just want to make sure we as a committee get yeah. the number right when we give it to the selectmen so we don't have to do this again um, just because of that. Um, thanks. If, if I can just clarify. So I think that... The FTEs, the the real FTE numbers are up here. Right. That's that, those are accurate. Right. And the dollar amounts are accurate. Uh, yeah, we just don't know the benefits, and, and we right, have an arrangement to determine that. But what will what will happen once the board of selectmen vote on an amount is that there will be a calculation. I believe you just said that a calculation will be built in mm -hmm. that will determine what the amount be that the schools will have and what the, the municipal side will have. Yeah, so thanks, and I mean, I, I, I don't, that's and then, helpful. Well, I'm oh, sorry, and then on February 5th, based on whatever number is voted on by the Board of Selectmen, we will come forward to you with a prioritized list. And then the committee will make that decision right. at that, on that night based on the number that has been allocated to the schools. So yeah, when I, that, that's very helpful, I mean, for, just looking at the numbers that we had as an estimate for benefits, it was about 220k for the restore position, 71k for restructure, and 164 for new. So it added up to you know, an, an amount that I think we should take into account. Let me put it that way. Yes. I am um, a member of the public at our a previous meeting made a really good point about this issue of reprioritization and Dr. Doherty I'm glad you just clarified the process I think it would be way premature for us to start cutting this list tonight because the amount of the final override is going to very much drive that discussion so if we have to cut it by 20k that might be something if we have to cut it by a much bigger number, right. that looks different. I don't think we have the information we possibly could to cut. And, and this is the exact same process we went through a year ago, and I think it worked very well, where I, I think this is a good process that we're on. If I can have one more piece to that. Sure. Sorry if I keep talking about that. And I think this speaks to the sustainability piece. I believe Paula brought it up. So once we know what the amount is that's been allocated to the schools, I think what our role will be is to put together a prioritized list that has a balance of FTEs and expenses, which will help with the sustainability piece moving forward. I think that's an important point, that we are looking at that very seriously, and what we do put forward will be a reflection and a balance of that with the intent of there being a sustainability piece. So. Yeah, I just asked yes. a question. So, the um, it's also complicated because sometimes people. I mean, everybody gets kind of sick time and vacation time, but not everybody takes health insurance. So they come in to health insurance, they go out of health insurance. So it's it's it, you can't even nail it down. You know, I mean, it's it's a fluid number. Yeah, this is the yeah. conversation we had the other night, and the town manager did make me feel very comfortable that he factors all of that in. Right. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, so just Dr. Doherty, with, to your point of, a few minutes ago about when you come in with your prioritized list, I look at that as the similar to what we started tonight with the superintendent's recommended list. Correct. And then this committee will have a another deliberation on that. Yep. So. Correct. So, 
Yes. I just want to say something that I, <clears throat> question of priorities here. I don't see anything on there that I haven't heard articulated well in our discussions, student and teacher and school benefit for. I don't see anything up there that is without educational merit in my view, okay? What, what I'm thinking in balance with that, I don't think anything up there is wholly frivolous or without basis. And, and, and if, if all of this were funded, I see student benefit and teacher benefit accruing to, to our schools um, as articulated in these conversations by different people. What I am thinking about in balance with that is that, of course, this is a request for taxpayer money, right? So, so we're asking the taxpayer to pay for something. I'm concerned about the evidence I've seen or haven't seen for me personally that convinces me that the request, the full request is sufficiently, um, the, the growth rate with all of these additional resources into our school system is sufficiently knowable to, to provide what I would consider a reasonable window of sustainability. I, I think that's personally around, uh, I mean, it's just in one person's opinion, but at least three years, right, that you need to, you, you don't want to have um, hire someone and have to let them go the, the next year or two years later, and hopefully you can keep them far far longer. Um, but for a three-year window, when, when we have these 5% growth rates, for me, the priority, my, my way of thinking is that there's the greatest certainty in my mind about the growth rate of the existing FTEs that we have. So we know what our current school system grows at. It's 5.2%. So if we reverse and restore cuts that we just made half an hour ago, I think, in my view, there's the greatest certainty around what that will cost <coughs> year over year over year. It's about 5.2%. If we start adding in beyond that, I really hope, to Selectman Berman's point and others, that we grow our way into all of this. I really do. I really hope that's in our future as a community. I just think that as we go beyond reversing FY19 cuts, that we need to do so carefully and thoughtfully with evidence of sustainability for like what I view as a three-year window, but others could have other views, uh, that we're going to be able to retain those resources and, and, and FTEs to benefit our students and teachers. So for me, that's an important distinction. Are you, are you retaining or are you adding? And restructuring is somewhere in the middle. The uncertainty is in the middle. To me, it's, it's the balance is, yes, educational benefit, but how much uncertainty in future growth rates? Because that's what's driving these painful discussions. This 2% difference between you know, percent of money that increase that we have to spend year over year versus level service, that 2% is $800,000. Hmm. And if we have to make $800,000 of cuts next year, we, we, we cannot have an optimism bias here, folks. We cannot go out, leave this room, and think everything, you know, we're just going to get fired up. And I think we should do that. We should inform the voters. We should advocate for um, you know, the benefit of, of the students in schools. And we definitely need, in my view, an override. But I want to be really careful and thoughtful about what if whatever that process gives us at the end is a no. What's going to happen then? What are these schools going to look like? And I, I think we should talk more about that. I'm sure people will, but to me, that's the other side. As you as you as you introduce more uncertainty by adding more and more things into this budget request, into this override request, I just think it's riskier and riskier um, uh, of a political process to defend it. Thanks. Anyone else? Anyone from the community? There's a motion on the table. Yep. Can I, yes. Can I motion? <laughs> Sure. I, well, I would, I, w I don't want to, well, you can, but I, I, the benefits, it was very clear that Bob told us to take it off this discussion and that it was going to the selectmen, the okay. benefits piece. So, so can we just establish the that language? the number we're going to have and will include some incremental increase right. to be agreed upon in consultation with, yeah. with others? Yeah, that the, so the, the 2.436 million is in Pre the motion. Net of benefits. And the, yes. any benefits is going to be worked in collaboration with the town manager to be reflected as the Board of Selectmen ultimately mm -hmm. decide. When did the did she get that? Did you get that? Do you want me to write it down? I have it mostly written down. <laughs> yes.
How you doing? Nicole. I had a quick question. Um, one thing that I feel like you didn't actually talk about about this plan was the restoring classroom computer technology as well as the 1.0 FD computer technician. So with those combined, it's over $100,000 plus the benefits we're talking about. Um, I just wanted to know, are they dependent on one another? So we need do we need to restore the 1.0 FT in order to restore the classroom computer Is that a question? No. Thanks. Dr. Doherty, I can answer, but... Do you want me to answer? Yeah. I, I don't know if we want to start prioritizing, so I... Uh, no. She was asking... Well, is so one, I guess... Related one to the other. Are they tied is one dependent on the other? I, <laughs> no, are they tied together? <laughs> I, I, again, I, I don't know if we want to start getting into that discussion of prioritizing. I, I would say they're both equally as important. I think she was saying if you don't add the computer technician, do you need the technology? Will you still, will we still... I think based on the stories we've heard from staff and administrators during this process, I would say the technician is critically important, but we also need to continue to be on a continuous re renewal cycle for our technology. Mm -hmm. One is not dependent upon the other and vice versa. Jesus. Anyone else? Did you have to use? I have a question. I don't know how to ask it. Uh, good evening, John Arena, Chair Board of Selectmen. Um, Why would you just I'm going to ask an awkward question. Uh, two budgets were discussed tonight. I had to leave the room earlier and I just returned. I apologize. I missed some of the earlier discussion. Um, it's entirely possible that something different than one of these two budgets could end up being approved next week. And what? although I understand there's no appetite or need or desire or means to prioritize tonight, it strikes me that the school committee might want to at least internally think about how to do that. And maybe there are intermediate points besides the 2.43K, 0.43 million on the screen. I, I'm not advocating any change, but it, there's probably a couple of different outcomes that could occur, and it need not be the balanced budget nor the full budget. Have, have other intermediate points been contemplated than those two? Well, the, the balanced budget is in process now going to the town manager. That, that is Got done. It. Got it. So that's not coming up for discussion next week. Or the, I mean, uh, it will correct. come up with the FinCom. Correct. When I'm not sure when that. February in terms, 7th. In terms of uh, a prioritized list, I mean, I think we're uh, making kind of mental notes and kind okay. of f finding out the process and have asked the civil. <coughs> at this point, we haven't done that, and we our plan was to. Uh, unveil that on uh, the 5th of uh, February and that you know obviously would then be dependent upon we would uh, back you know build from the bottom up in terms of whatever the suggested override amount was yeah our board has no authority and wants no mean no authority to dictate policy or priority but sitting in your shoes for a minute I'd be saying to myself what are the intermediate points I might want to plan for and it sounds like you internally that those discussions have occurred even if they're not enough not prioritized but in the sense of how else would you build this at some intermediate point yeah that's 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 fair I mean we yeah. have uh, we've heard presentations on all of it uh, okay and we just haven't uh, drawn down on value judgments as to what's number one, what's number right. two. We're going to have the same problem on our side, so it's more a, a conversation than a, than a point. John, can I yes, Dr. John, just to explain the process. So this list was brought, put together by a, a team of administrators yep. on what we felt was the right direction. Internally, we're already starting to have a similar conversation as what happens if 
we don't get this full amount. You and we are looking right. at certain points. Good. Yeah, you can't wait till it happens. No, no, no. We're we're already having those conversations. Good. Good. Thank you. And on February fifth, we will present whatever the selectmen decide as a the number that would be the school allocation. We will present that on February fifth, a prioritized list to the school committee. Good. Thank you. Mrs. Webb. I guess I would, in my most optimistic moments um, of long service to this school district. Um, would like to say that I, you know, I know that there's a, a, a lot of discussion and dialogue that is going to happen in the next next number of days, and you know, there's a piece of it that factors in what will the what what do we what what can we all together figure out that the community might support, um, and I'm still, you know, ho and again, in my most optimistic, hopeful self, um, hope hoping that we come back here on the fifth. And we don't have that much hard, hard, hard work to do to figure out which one of these important things is not going to get done. So, you know, I. Skorowski. No, I'm off. Nick. So I have a different question. Um, going back to last year, we we received a, a tranche of 150k for science curriculum. We use that to do what we said we would do as a school system, and Gail gave a really good accounting of that at one of our meetings. Um, I'm wondering if there's a view that the amounts up here, if approved and if you know, voted favorably by voters, will they be, are they similarly earmarked for the purposes listed up there, and will there be an accounting to the public of how this money was spent line item by line item? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, Ms. Santy. So I, I just have two comments. One, um, on January 24th, we have the financial forum. And then on January 30th, we have the Board of Selectmen's meeting. So we have more opportunity. And I feel really uncomfortable right now because I feel like the sandbox of the school committee is being crossed and I'm very uncomfortable with that as a resident. Um, the Board of Selectmen has their role, the school committee has their role, and I think that we don't go over those lines and we stay focused on what the purpose of this meeting is. And then we go to the financial forum and then we go to the meeting on January 30th. Thank you. Are we ready for a vote? <clears throat> so just to clarify, we have um, on the table the reconstruction um, override budget at $2.436 million with the benefit eva evaluation, benefit calculation to be determined in collaboration with the town manager. Um, and that was read and seconded already? Mm hmm All those in favor? Opposed? And the motion carries five in favor, one opposed. Uh, there was oh, one report. Oh, uh, that concludes the oh. budget business for tonight. Thank you to everybody. We have a couple uh, more items. You we can have stay a couple if you like. things to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we. Doc. Dr. Darty, yes. Did you want to do the search? Yes, but I can do this quickly. If I think about it. Thank you. I need a heat Thank you. Um, so, in your packet is the timeline for the Reading Memorial High School principal search. I do want to take a moment and thank Mr. Barker for um, his time and dedication here in the Reading Public Schools. And I want to wish him the best of luck in his um, future endeavors. Um, as you can see here, the screening committee is, is going to be a balanced committee. I'm sorry, uh, what page is that? I'm sorry, from the packet? It's towards the end of the packet. Oh, sorry, okay. After the questions? It's before the email correspondence. Sorry, there it is. I've got it. Thank you. 
So the screening committee will have um, three administrators, three teachers, a staff member, a student, three parents on it. Um, we have been, um, we've had applications out for those um, areas for the last several days. Uh, actually, the due date is tomorrow. Uh, so we will put together, based on the number of people that, that have applied, we will put together a screening committee, which will be led by uh, Jennifer Bove, who's our Human Resource Administrator. Um, I will be attending all of the um, different uh, interviews, as well as the entire process. Um, ultimately, under uh, Massachusetts general law, uh, building principal appointment is, is done by the superintendent of the schools. The way that our process has worked for several years and has actually been very successful, uh, given the fact that we've had some outstanding principals right now in our in other administrators in our district, um, is we always use the notion that you need to trust the process. And the process starts with a screening of several candidates which are interviewed in a confidential setting by this screening committee. The screening committee will move forward a certain number of candidates. Um, those candidates will have a, <coughs> excuse me, a one-on-one -on -one interview with me and I take the input from the screening committee as part of my interview questions and the purpose of that pre-finalist um, interview is to see if those candidates are worthy of becoming finalists. Because once they become finalists, they're public. Um, there's also a lot of reference checks done at that point as well. Once the finalists are announced, then they go through a fairly rigorous process of um, additional interviews by district leadership team, by teachers. <coughs> we have open microphone night for community, open microphone night for staff. Um, we also have students as part of that with students interview the, um, the candidates. Um, depending on where we are in the process, we may do site visits. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't based on where we are in the process. Our hope is to have a appointment right after February vacation. We have received several applications for this position, which is a good sign, because the high school principal position is a difficult position um, in terms of the depth of the pool. Um, it is one of, more, one of the more difficult positions to fill. Dr. Doherty, so on some positions, I'm just drawing a blank right now. We've, oh, I, at least I know with the finance director, they come to a school committee meeting. Uh, is that, is, can that, I know that they, isn't something we typically have done for a high school <coughs> or any principal, but I mean, I think this is the face of the, I mean, community. I think it would be nice just to just throw it out, maybe have them, the finalists, come to a school committee meeting, or is that? Yeah. So to, to your point, the director of finance is appointed by the school committee. Right. So I that's know. why yeah. the yeah. they do come to the No, school. I know this will be different than maybe we can think about we, it. We can certainly try. We've always asked the school committee to come to the open microphone yeah, session yeah, and they have those, the ability to ask yeah. questions. Um, some of it is timing and logistics because yeah, no, I don't a lot of this is done yeah. the same day. So we can certainly look to see if that's something we can do. Yes. So I have a question about the amount of time that the position is open. It looks like it's open for about three weeks. Am I reading that right? From January 5th to the 26th? No, it goes until the end of the year. Yes, that, that's, that's the normal. So that's our normal. But how does that compare with the amount of time that the comparable positions are open in other districts? It's the same. It's the same. In yeah, actually, some districts. places it's longer. So what would be the impact if we extended it for a month? Oh, I think you would lose candidates. Any other impact on because you've schools? got you've got other searches. There are the high school searches going on right now. What does it mean? Can interview? Do you have to? Oh, here's another question. Do you have to have? Can you interview applicants before the deadline is closed for applications? No. Is that a legal requirement or just? No, that's part, you. You need the screening committee to be a part of it. But is there any legal reason why we? In terms, I know there's a lot of process around hiring in public schools. Is there any 
legal reason why you couldn't begin interviewing applicants while new applicants are applying? There is no legal requirement. However, the process that we've used for several years is a process that works, mm -hmm. and you don't want to lose candidates. So, because these candidates are not just applying to Reading, they're applying to other positions as well. And so, you're, you are competing with other, with other school districts, and they may not wait around. If they but get an offer, they're not, they may not wait around. But could you begin interviewing qualified candidates while you're still accepting applications from other candidates? We, the, the way our process is set up, we cannot. That's our choice to do it that way. That is Borowski. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if this is helpful, Mr. Blavin, but before my term on the school committee, I served as a parent representative on a screening committee that hired a principal. Mm -hmm. And just as a procedural matter, the entire committee, which is a large number of people, pick a day. Mm -hmm. And they're like, we are going to sit from 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. and mm -hmm. interview candidates. So to do rolling interviews with that many people, I think, would be unmanageable. And I have to say the process was very... Um, very thorough and very good. Having that many different perspectives in the room led to really good discussion. I saw something from a parent perspective, but it was really interesting to hear a teacher perspective and admin perspective. So I will validate that I believe it's a process that works. Dr. Dobbs. I was actually going to say the same thing. Having been on multiple search committees, um, I think one of the real richness is one of the most rich parts of the the process is the different perspectives. And if you're not all in the same room at the same time interviewing the same candidate, uh, my, my um, sympathies go out to the candidates because it's an incredibly hard process to go through, but um, doing it on one day works because all the people see all the, all the candidates. Can, can I ask a Yes. So, um, I, I, too, I too am concerned that we get as large a pool as we can because it is such an important role. Is this, um, I mean, in higher ed, there's kind of the season, you know, like October's when you apply and so forth. Is this the season that, you know, principals who are looking for jobs that they're typically posting, everybody's sending out all their applications? I would so say forth. this is a good, is it, okay. this is a good time. And Ms. Bovey's been the, in the back the, nodding her head. The, super, okay. <laughs> the, the superintendent right. hiring season is ending. Yep. And the now you're starting to hit the principals, and this we're in we're right in the right timeline. Yeah. Okay. Because like you want to be at the beginning, so you get the good candidates, mm -hmm. but you don't want to be too early before they start looking. I mean, it's a there's a sweet spot, sort of. You know? Yeah. Okay. I, so. Yes. No, it's, I I understand the. Um, can understand the benefits of having the collective perspectives of people and the difficulty of scheduling all those people for a single day, which sounds like a very efficient way to do this. I, I would be in favor of a, um, a schedule that allowed for a first round and a second round that had a first round and didn't close applications on January 26th, but closed them for round one. Do the community interview. If no candidate, if he, the community that that collective committee wants, screening committee wants to look for other candidates, other applications can still be accepted. And I'd like to see a schedule that allows for a flexible round, one round and a two round process together. So that's what I'm looking for here. Well, yes. Mr. Robinson, yes. I, I just want to add though, if we do that, we're going to lose candidates. I, I've, been, I've been doing this process for 20 years. And we've tweaked it along the way. We will lose candidates. Well, I think, I guess the concern too is that I mean people may still be employed somewhere and if they're going through round one and t their their name is out there and uh, for a while uh, yeah to, to just clarify the point isn't to put any candidate through a second round nor is it to slow down the process if you find a good candidate in round one hire that person absolutely if you don't find someone at least you have while you're going through that process other people's Resumes coming in three weeks strikes me as a short period of time to have a position open. Could, could we? I see Ms. Bobes in the room. Dr. Darty, could maybe she add a comment for us? She absolutely can. She's been. Now that Mrs. Webb put you on the spot. Well. Hello. Um, yeah, so I know what I've been briefly hearing from afar was some concern with the timeline that we're having, considering we may be losing out on some potentially good candidates. Um, I think just to second what Dr. Darty was saying, um, we 
are at a very good point in the year for hiring a principal. Um, this is definitely the quote unquote season for that. Um, I don't think we're ahead of the game. We are definitely not behind. Um, with that being said, I too am concerned about loss of candidates if we are to keep this posting open and postpone with the hopes that maybe we're going to have a few more trickle in that look good. I think our chances at bringing someone on who is going to be best fit, we have a better chance of doing that with the current model that we have. Thank you. Thank you. It, oh, yes. I know, I know we got to move on, but it also does kind of signal, in higher ed at least, if there's that rolling thing, it kind of signals that you don't like your first applicant pool, and that can discourage candidates too. It kind of almost can give them a message that, eh. Yeah. So. Do we need a motion? Yes, yeah, there is do. a motion to, um, so let me get that out there. Yeah. Motion to approve the RMHS principal search process and timeline as presented. Second. Second. Okay, so the motion is on the table. And if. Yeah. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? The motion does pass five to one. Oh, did you? And reports. Oh, really quickly? Yeah. I know it's late, um, but a couple of weeks ago, the Reading Recreation Committee met, and we had a presentation from Mr. Commodaris, Commodaris, the president of Friends of Reading Recreation, and there are a lot of exciting events coming up, and I promised I would update the community, especially where we had parents here tonight with young children who may not be aware of the Friends of Reading Recreation. On May 4th, there is the 11th annual Daddy-Daughter Dance. It's adorable. On May 18th, there is the ninth annual fireworks poker tournament. Someone at this table almost made the final table last year. It's a great <laughs> evening. June 16th is the 13th annual Kids Fun Run uh, with races have varying, varying links for children as young as under three through eighth graders. So a really fun event to do a quick run and, and be healthy in June. Um, Town Day fireworks are June 16th. The annual middle school track and field clinic is July 9th through 12th. The, uh, on July 19th is the 11th annual Lions and Friends of Reading Recreation 5K. I attended it last year. I cannot recommend that race. It's just a lovely, fun event. It's a big event. It's a no beautiful hills. course. No hills? Yeah. It's, there might be some hills. There really are. <laughs> it's, it's actually pretty hilly. <laughs> Um, and the final, uh, two final, three final things to point out. Um, in the, this coming fall, the Friends of Running Recreation plans to again sponsor the middle school cross country team. I can speak as a parent of a runner this year. It is an explosively popular program. It's growing exponentially every year. Um, it is, we have a very strong cross country program in our middle schools thanks to this organization. Um, the new book of winter and spring writing rec programs are out right now. You probably got it in your mailbox this past week or so like I did. And very important date coming up for parents with young children and elementary age children. The second week of February is when you can get early bird specials for the Reading Rec Summer Camp. It fills up quickly. If you are interested in that program, I would get online in the next couple of weeks. Um, and final note, the Friends of Reading Rec, uh, if, for, if you didn't catch any of that or you want to learn more, F-O-R-R, which stands for Friends of Reading Recreation, F-O-R-R 01867.org. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nice job. Thank you. We need a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Yes. All right. Six, Six zero. zero. Six zero. <laughs>